Well, good evening and welcome to the August 9th Federal City Council. Can I have your attention? Good evening and welcome to the August 9th, uh, 2022 Federal City Council meeting. Would you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Great to see a great crowd here. Um, and uh, we've got a lot of business to do. We've got uh, Mayor Demersing issues and report. First up, uh, we had uh, re our recent community events. We had the 66th annual Salmon Bake at Seal Lake Park. It was absolutely an amazing event and beautiful evening. Um, salmon was great. Uh, the company was great. And uh, thanks again to Kiwanis uh, for hosting that great uh, traditional event. Uh, we had a, um, a movies at uh, Town Square Park. We had Encanto on Saturday, July 23rd. Uh, we had National Night Out on August 2nd. We uh, had uh, a couple dozen locations in our community in which those in which uh, those uh, festivities were had. And uh, the chief and I and, and Bill went to about uh, and several council members went to several of those. I, I think I got to about five or six that evening and uh, it was great. Uh, it's good to see everybody and talk about uh, community safety and, and uh, talk about coming together as a community. So that's a great um, annual event. In fact, it's uh, the this council is so committed to that event that we've actually permanently moved our first meeting in August um, to the second week in August to uh, uh, today's date uh, because the National Night Out is always on that first Tuesday. So that's where we uh, uh, we've actually uh, enshrined it in our uh, in our council rules. Okay, we had um, the uh, African American uh, Black Community Quarterly Meeting on uh, eight four. That was in this room, and it was a uh, a good discussion about uh, community um, uh, concerns and uh, uh, a really good forum. It was both online and in person. Okay, upcoming community events. We've got, Am, are you ready for this? A grand opening at 645 in the morning. Um, and uh, I'm going to need to set the alarm. We're going to have multiple alarm clocks uh, uh, set up. This is for the Amazon Fresh Ribbon Cutting on August 11th. That is this Thursday. Uh, 645 is when it starts. I think they'll actually open the open the doors to the long awaited Amazon fresh uh, there um, uh, at uh, the, the site formerly referred to as the Sears building at the, um, at the commons. Uh, I think they're going to open the doors at seven. So they've asked me uh, not to talk too long. I've got a, just a brief PowerPoint I'll share. Just kidding. Um, just kidding. A little, a little mayoral humor. Um, so uh, movies at town square park, we've got jungle cruise, which is really fun with the rock on uh, August 13th. Um, and I think that starts at 845 as the sun and the earth are moving in different, uh, uh, the, uh, the start time gets a little bit earlier as we start to head towards September. So Jungle Cruise, Town Square Park, massive screen, totally free. Uh, Susan and I are making popcorn. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, old school. All right. Performing Arts and Events Center. Um, we had the, we've got the fifth anniversary event on August 19th. So come on, come all to visit our beautiful uh, event, uh, the, our beautiful event center uh, that is now up and running. Um, uh, you know, post COVID. Okay. We've got the lions club car show at the commons mall on August 27th at 9 AM. It'll run usually to about uh, mid afternoon, two or three. Um, and, uh, that, that's a really fun thing to, you know, a lot of cars, a lot of great cars. In fact, actually, sometimes when I'm uh, out and about and I see a really cool car, uh, I, I suggest that they, uh, join the, uh, lions, uh, uh, car show, uh, at the mall. Okay, we've got the biennial budget meeting uh, calendar for uh, the 23-24 uh, biennial budget. And I don't know if we can put that on the on the screen there, uh, but uh, we've got uh, the calendar um, for those meetings. So thank you very much. Um, it's not going to do any any good. Do we have anybody back? Uh, or if IT can stand by. All right. Could you please if see it? Um, do we have anybody on YouTube or is anybody uh, watching on YouTube? Can you tell Thomas, can you tell if anybody, uh, the voice from above is Thomas in the back, our uh, very own wizard of Oz. Thomas, uh, can you, uh, can you tell if anybody's on uh, YouTube watching? Seven are watching on YouTube. Very good. Thank you very much. Oz has company. All right. So, uh, how are we doing on that budget calendar? There we go. There we go. So we're going to start this. Uh, there we go. Maybe we can just go just a little bit. 
we've got Tuesday, September 20th, um, 5 p.m. Later that night at the council meeting, Monday, September 26th at 5 p.m. Department uh, presentations, Thursday, September 29th at 5 p.m. Uh, Tuesday, October 4th at 5 p.m. Uh, for a study session before the meeting. Uh, later that night, uh, at the uh, actually Tuesday, October 18th at the next council meeting at 5 p.m. And then uh, later that night at the council meeting, uh, we'll have a revenue public hearing, preliminary public hearing on the uh, two-year budget. Then on Tuesday, November 1st, 6.30 p.m. Uh, at our regular city council meeting, finally, uh, final budget public hearing and uh, and the ordinances will be presented and then uh, second reading, excuse me, uh, enactment and second reading on Tuesday, November, 15, uh, November 15th at the regular city council meeting. So uh, these will be uh, recorded, uh, they'll be televised. Um, and I would really highly encourage, uh, if you can, I try to figure out which uh, department presentations that you're interested in so you can watch those or watch them on replay. All right, uh, that concludes uh, my Meyer, uh, mayor's report. Uh, and now we've got the most important part of the evening, which is public comment. Um, okay. And if we go, uh, wait, uh, Stephanie, remind me, if when we get to about 8.30, we may take like a 10-minute break right around that time. Um, but uh, uh, just to make sure that we... We will be uh, we Exactly. All right. Exactly. Sometimes we need just a, just a little bit of a break. Okay. I'll go ahead and read out a couple of names. And if you could um, uh, uh, just kind of sort of queue up, um, that would be great. Is that for... Oh, general. Okay. General. Oh, general. Okay. All right. Um, so here's what I've got. Uh, Jillian Milstein, then Roger Flyger, then Mary Ellis, and Anne Michelle Hart to start us off with. My name is Gillian Milstein. Sorry about the phone. My printer is dead. Um, I've been a resident in Federal Way for the last four years, um, and I wanted to talk about uh, homelessness and drug use on the light rail that is quickly approaching our city. Um, so I started riding the light rail four years ago in 2018 from Angle Lake to the University of Washington, where I work as a research scientist. Um, the light rail was clean, and there were plenty of guards checking tickets, and I felt very safe. Um, I found myself eagerly awaiting when it would get to Federal Way and I wouldn't have to drive to Angle Lake. And I would regularly vote to fund the extensions of the light rail. Um, I'm very supportive of a comprehensive and safe public transit system. Emphasis on safe. <laughs> um, when the pandemic hit, the light rail went from a pleasant commute to a lawless zone of chaos and danger. It remains that now and has grown significantly worse in the last year. I've watched crack rocks sold aboard the light rail in broad daylight, people heating up, and inhaling fentanyl is a daily occurrence. Two weeks ago, a man exited the train that I was on and outside of the UW light rail station, stood up on a planter where all could see and proceeded to urinate. As I walked by, he pointed directly at me, grabbed his visible, visible genitals, and made a lewd gesture with them. I pulled out my phone to call the university police and give his description, and he, becoming angry and erratic, then chased me a block down the street on the campus of a university. I've been spit at, yelled, and cursed at, forced to inhale the secondhand smoke of both cigarettes and illegal drugs, all while on my daily commute. I have no hope that Seattle will do anything to change this behavior from individuals who use the light rail and the taxpayer dollars as their personal temporary homes and drug dens. But I don't live in Seattle. I live here in Federal Way. I love it, and I made it my home and light rail is coming here in 2024. I get on and off at the current southern end of the line, Angle Lake, when a courageous transit guard actually throws someone off the light rail who's doing the things I've discussed, they get off at Angle Lake. They wander into the surrounding neighborhoods of SeaTac, which I've also watched degrade over the last several years. Long story short, it's coming to our city and some things need to change. Otherwise, the cancerous and supposedly empathetic policy of Seattle will come flooding into downtown Federal Way via the light rail. There's nothing empathetic about letting people destroy their body and mind with these sort of drugs, and there's nothing empathetic about making commuters like myself face down these individuals. I have a couple of suggestions. One, more funding for the Federal Way Police, specifically targeting illegal drug use. People are using these drugs on the light rail openly and callously. They know they won't face charges for it. Two, outlaw panhandling in Federal Way. 
street corners are being overrun by people building temporary houses, using illegal drugs, and engaging in prostitution. And finally, I don't know if you have this kind of power, but if you can, lobby for payment gates at all light rail stations. If you don't pay, you can't enter. Unless you want Federal Way to become another foul, unsafe branch of Seattle, you need to consider these policy upgrades in response to the incoming challenges that the light rail expansion will bring to our city. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you. Very well said. Gillian, what's, what city do you reside in? I'm sorry. What, what city? You say you live in? Federal Way. Federal Way, great. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Okay. All right, Roger, fly here. Good evening, Mayor, City Council members, uh, city staff. It's nice to see you again. It's been a while. I'm going to be talking about the public market that we're trying to bring forward in Federal Way. I first thought about a public market sometime around 2015 when helping the current farmer's market find a permanent home and raise the profile of the City of Federal Way to encourage new businesses to consider Federal Way as a place to expand. We looked at and thought the former Federal Way public school bus maintenance facility yard would have been a great opportunity. But shortly afterwards, the property was sold to a developer, probably good for our search because of the environmental issues that unfortunately hounded that property. <coughs> a couple of years ago, I initiated talks with local community members searching for answers to vital questions, what could be included in a public market, including a suitable location. At that time, I sponsored a booth at the Salmon Bake a couple years ago, gathering more feedback, but I had to put the project on hold for family and business reasons. I reinstated this as a priority for myself and our, my community in 2021. Subsequently, I filed for a charity nonprofit status with the Secretary of State. I've been joined with a, a dedicated group of people on the board who have the same passion for a public market as I do. We've had meetings with the Federal Way Planning Department personnel gathering more information to assist in creating a successful public market. We are engaged with key grant writers and others to help raise funds reaching out to city council members, members of the US Senate and House of Representatives and our state legislators. If we haven't contacted you at this point, I'm pretty sure you can expect a telephone call. The individual who is an architect on our board is putting together a vision of what would look like as part of our feasibility study. I think that's a very important part. Mm -hmm. Lately, we attended the SWAT Strength, Weaknesses, Opportunity and Threat meeting with Keith and Cheney from the planning department, which was attended by a group of people, approximately 16 plus. There was a lot of information shared from everyone and our board is working on developing our own SWAT study and we'll share that with the planning department and the city council and the mayor's office. Finally, we will be seeking funding from the city of Federal Way to help cover the costs of a more robust feasibility study. And um, thank you, and if you have any questions, and by the way, I'll see you at the car show. I'm gonna be the master of ceremonies. Oh, very good. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you, Roger. Okay, Mary Ellis. Hello again. I am so thrilled to be here and announce, and actually be able to announce, because they finally released the gag order on us, and I'm not good at that, that Camp Kilworth is saved. So anybody that knows about Camp Kilworth that served the Boy Scouts from 1934 until it was closed down in 2016. And we are so thrilled because it was saved because of Forterra, and I mean, Forterra came in and through CFT grants and other grants managed to buy the property and they signed a long-term lease with the YMCA of Greater Seattle and uh, they see a great need for a camp here and we're thrilled half to death it'll continue to serve children and KEEP which is the Kilworth Environmental Education Preserve which is a few of our members here and they uh, what we've done is put forth a landmark nomination. So a historic heritage landmark nomination. And that hearing is going to be August 25th. And there is a Zoom hearing. I actually gave that form over, but uh, it'll be uh, 
August 25th at 4.30. There will be Zoom or, unfortunately, it'll be, they'll be meeting down in Seattle at their offices. But uh, definitely, you know, we'd like to see support for that. And so what Keep has done is tomorrow at the regional library, which is on first, we have a meeting from 5.30 to 7. And Forterra will be there to talk about it. The Y will be there to talk about their plans. And Sarah Steen from King County Heritage Landmarks will be there to talk about the process. Because uh, anybody that has been to Kilworth and knows about Kilworth, we want your support. So uh, and we are just uh, immensely pleased. It's taken a lot of years. And the last few, I've had to be a little quiet. And as I said, I'm not real good at that. <laughs> but now I am happy very happy to announce that this camp will continue serving children. Well, families, not just children, but the families, long after I'm gone. So uh, it's been a long trip, and I've thanked you for all for listening. Three different attempts. You, you guys were willing to do it once, 2007, but unfortunately, Supreme Court 2009 wouldn't let that happen. Scouts tried to organize, but now it's done. So Come join us tomorrow night. Find out more. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary, for all your work on this. And Michelle Hart. Good evening. I'm Ann Michelle Hart, Chief of Staff for the Public Market. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge that it is Farmers Market Week. And I want to also tell you that growing farm products locally and selling them locally for every $77,000 in sales creates one job. So I want to congratulate our farmer's market on doing such a great job. How do public markets drive opportunity and change? As I spoke about in an earlier meeting, investing in micro and small business development, the city gains additional tax revenue through business growth and these, in these new businesses. Not all of them are going to be retail driven. Some of them are going to be services, and we're going to aim for a cross section of businesses that are going to provide goods and services that our city residents need in addition to attracting those types of businesses that will appeal to tourists. But public markets have an impact far beyond money. Public markets can give cities identities, a sense of purpose, and for its residents, a market can create a sense of belonging and of neighbors helping neighbors and a feeling of community and pride. It also gives exposure to other cultures. By developing micro and small businesses in the heart of our city, we increase exposure to other cultures and by getting to know and understand each other, we reduce for friction between these groups. Arts at the market. Arts reflect local identity. We are so diverse, but you wouldn't know it by looking at our city. Farmers market innovations. By giving our farmers market a permanent home wherever we end up being, because we do hope to bring them over with us so they have a permanent place to be, it could eventually allow the farmers market vendors to do traveling food markets to other parts of our city on other days of the week so that we can expand the availability of fresh produce to other members of our society. Public markets also protect street vendors. Often a livelihood is chosen by society's most vulnerable people. Street vending is pretty risky. Just last month, an immigrant in Italy was stabbed to death while he, while he was trying to sell trinkets to a tourist. By allowing them space in or around the public market, the foot traffic can reduce incidents of violence uh, experienced by street vendors. In every city, there are programs and projects that are purely altruistic, mostly depending on grants or donations for public service. So think food banks or uh, public health clinics. Other projects are launched solely for financial gain in mind. So think about businesses. Public markets cross those divides. They are financially beneficial to the city. They operate as a hub for community needed services and they cultivate a heart and soul for residents that is needed in order to feel a connection to each other. They are a mix of self-supporting businesses and social programs. I urge you to look beyond the monetary gain and focus and see all the added value of a public market, and we hope that you will support this community-driven event. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, in order of appearance next, uh, Cynthia ricks Macatan, Suzanne Vargo, then Anna Patrick, then Lamont Stiles, Susan Strong, and Juan Luis Juarez in that order.
moving a little slow these days. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor, um, Deputy Mayor, and Council President, and the rest of the Council. My name is Cynthia Riggs McElton. I am a resident here, but tonight I'm coming to you um, to talk about Virginia Mason Franciscan Health, where I work, um, a youth violence program that we have. Thanks to Representative Jamila Taylor, we were able to um, secure a $2 million grant to expand our youth violence prevention initiative to all of South King County. Let me just say the majority of the representatives and senators represented in South King County voted for the proviso and are looking forward to us expanding um, youth violence prevention programming in their cities and in their ju jurisdiction. Um, to give you a sense of uh, what that might look like, for example, we will be hopefully working in Enumclaw where they've seen a 100% uptick in suicide amongst youth from ages 12 to 17, right? Um, and gun uh, firearm being the number one um, uh, method for suicide. Yet along the Kent, Renton, Des Moines, um, Federal Way corridor, um, you're seeing more gun violence associated with uh, substance use, gang violence, et cetera. So while we may be addressing gun violence, the nature of it may be looking different by each subregion within South King County. We've uh, contracted with the state for the $2 million. We recently released a request for qualifications uh, last week for regional navigators who will be in charge of contracting with specific community-based organizations to provide by, um, youth violence programming uh, or youth violence prevention programming, excuse me, in each of the subregions. And the South region is the one that um, I think would be of most interest to you, which includes Federal Way, Des Moines, Auburn, Pacific, Algona, and of course the unincorporated areas of, of South King County that's close to us. And so I'm just thankful for the opportunity to expand our services. Um, and we will be coming back to you every quarter, letting you know how we're doing, who we're working with. And I would like to thank the city. We have a couple of um, school resource officers who will be participating on the review panel for selection of the regional navigators and those community-based organizations that will be providing services here in the city. Um, lastly, now I'm switching gears, no longer Virginia Mason Franciscan Health, but as your human services commissioner, please do consider tonight um, funding ARPA for $3 million or more for um, social services, human services, and um, the, hopefully the Human Services Commission will have the opportunity to review proposals for the ARPA funding. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Susan. Susan Vargo. <clears throat> Hi, thanks, Council and Mayor. Um, I just wanted to comment once again on the O&M facility um, that is wanting to be at the Annex Park. After the very lengthy discussion, I was left feeling that the citizens' comment were put on the back burner. The entire conversation turned to the possibility of a new built skate park. While this is an important part of the Annex Park, it is certainly not the only issue at hand. I feel the city council, parks, and mayor are using the skate park issue as a distraction to the many other important issues, such as the environment, our history, and the desperate need for more green spaces. While it was wonderful to have the opportunity to speak, and I do appreciate being heard, I do not feel our words were in the minds of the council after hearing the city speak for over two hours. I would like to offer a remedy to the lack of transparency and streamlining that takes away from the desires of the people. It would be a wonderful thing if the city were to share their facts with the public prior to our co public comment. This would give the public the ability to respond in a timely manner to the new information laid out by the city. While I may have had a speech already prepared, if my questions were answered during that time, I wouldn't need to waste time speaking about it. And if new issues came up, I would like to respond to those. Also, the council would have the ability to ask questions of the public and engage with us as well. Is it possible to rearrange our meetings to better accommodate the public and our council? 
This would better represent the desires of the public more evenly as a streamlined process makes it very difficult for us to follow and keep our comments in a timely manner and cohesive. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. All right. Anna Patrick. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, I would like to speak to um, the health through housing. I missed the last meeting. There was no sound. So I kind of, I'm kind of going with what somebody shared with me here. And um, so I just, I've been, I've been spending some time looking at um, exempt properties in cities and comparing properties. So I just want to share starting off um, a little bit. Um, City of Kent has 3,768 subsidized housing units. Auburn has 2,994. And Federway has 4,176. So that's current. Um, that's not what's coming down the pike. Doesn't include what's coming down the pike. So we have a large, we're bearing a, lar a lot of the subsidized housing. So with that said, we're also, the taxpayers are picking up a lot of that burden of the need in our community. So um, with this housing, it's, uh, I, I don't know where we're at with trying to set ourselves up for success as a city and, and in defense of what King County's bringing here. Uh, but I've heard that um, a lot of the referrals are coming, well, from outside the city. So we're bringing on an addition to what we already have that we're managing. And then um, as far as the population of need, and then we're also, a lot of the referrals are coming from the day centers, from what I understand. this is kind of secondhand information. So um, if you drive through that area, you will see that there is a large impact in that community, uh, in that area of town. Um, you'll see people camping out in front of buildings overnight, um, the motels nearby where uh, people gather. So um, I don't know what that's gonna look like for our downtown. I'm very, very concerned, especially for the people that live next door. Um, I think we talked about a um, conditional use permit or something. We were going to talk about maybe something like that that would set some limits on what happens there. I don't know where we're at with that, but um, I really think that we need to be on the defensive, especially with being the end of the line, as somebody mentioned with the transit, people coming here. Um, it's, it's a lot for us to take on. And it's a lot for taxpayers to take on when we already have a smaller tax base right now um, with Sound Transit buying up our property. I feel like it's not fair and we're being set up as a community to uh, have a harder time. So thank you. All right. Susan Strong. Mayor Farrell, city council members. I'm Susan Strong. I live in Federal Way. Yesterday about 1 p.m. I was caught in stopped traffic headed west on South 320th, just past the library. Traffic moved very slowly. I could see two cars stopped in the middle of the road and a civilian doing something that looked like he was pumping on something on the ground. Then I saw someone relieve him and I realized they were performing CPR on someone in the middle of South 320th. That's when I heard police cars and saw emergency, emergency vehicles arriving on scene. As I drove past the scene, I saw the deceased person on the ground and another person in handcuffs being escorted away by the police. I continued to hear police and fire arrive as I drove away. I have lived in Federal Way since 1975. In the past couple of years, I began to notice that things have changed in our city. I was used to seeing the occasional homeless person but that has changed into drug and alcohol addicted people all over the city. I realize there are many reasons for the growing homeless situation, for the theft in the stores, the theft of cars, people driving like there are no driving rules, gun violence, prostitution, and on and on. The reason I witnessed, the situation I witnessed yesterday brought it all into focus for me. Never did I think I would see a deceased person who had been shot to death, lying in the middle of a main street in Federal Way, in the middle of the day. We need some changes in Federal Way. I am going to be part of reclaiming our city. Thank you. Thank you. 
I, we, uh, you guys, I, I think we council at the last retreat. Let's try not to do the uh, applause because uh, I think the council has, has. We want to make sure that everybody uh, has a sort of an equal footing in the uh, in the chambers. Also, would you please remember to state the name of the city you're from? All right, uh, Lamont Styles. Peace and blessings, peace and blessings to everyone. Glad to be here. I just wanted to talk real quick. Every time I come up here, I always change what I'm going to say because I listen to what people say, and then I'm like, I switch it up. But um, first, the farmers in the public market, um, I've been able to be a part of the, the farmers market the past couple of weeks, and I just love Federal Way, man. Like, we have a beautiful city. It's I know we, you know, the land itself, but what makes it beautiful is the, the people. You know what I'm saying? And so... Um, when we talk about these issues, right, when we talk about violence, when we talk about homelessness, when we talk about drug addiction, like, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't see any real answers. You know what I'm saying? We was, I was just here like a couple week, couple days ago, and, you know, we asked the mayor what was, what was his idea for the violence prevention. It was like, more police. And listen, don't beat me up. Don't beat me up. But I'm just saying, there are other ways, man. Invest in the people. You see what I'm saying? When you're talking about violence, you're talking about when you say gangs, these are somebody's relatives. We know the gang member might have a brother that's in college. Like these are maybe not some people's relatives, but these are our relatives. And so there are other ways to go about dealing with this situation. When you go into the schools, I volunteer in the schools. Man, it's so violent. I don't know if you guys know, but they had so many fights like almost every day. And then it spills over into the community. They're literally recruiting the kids from school. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, how do you not make this connection with all of this that's going on? When you're talking, I watched Gravity Coffee on Pack Highway. I'm looking at somebody like, like um, one of the previous people said, um, shooting up or whatever he was doing right in front of the, of the coffee spot. And I'm just like, how, where are we at? Like, why is this even possible? And so when I look at the, the the solutions, I feel that there are solutions, but everything can't be the police. You know what I'm saying? Like there's only, can you imagine, just imagine if we had a police department that one section of the police department dealt with gangs and violent crimes and things of that nature. And then another section of the police department dealt with mental health and, and, and nonviolent situations to where we're just not having them chase everything. We have the solutions right here. We got the little the kids right here. Why we don't invest in our community, man? Like there are solutions. You got ARPA money, 19 million. That's a lot of money that could go to helping. When we when I go into the schools and I'm talking to the kids about solutions to what they see to the violence, give them something to do. I have a barber college for sixty thousand dollars. We do scholarship ten students. These I got kids that's beating me down. We scholarship two just. Out of my pocket, not even my pocket. I just was like, I, we going to use one book and these clippers, and I'm going to show you guys how to do this. We have to invest in ourselves, and there are a lot of good things that we can do, but I just don't see real solutions, and I would like to see the council real solutions. But the solution is right here, real rap. All right. Um, Juan Luis Juarez, Ramos. Hello, uh, my name is Juan Luis Juarez Ramos. You probably don't know me, <laughs> but um, I live in unincorporated Auburn, but I have been mainly raised here in Federal Way because I live a block from TJ and, and the city. Uh, I'm in, I live mainly in Military Road and I go to a store named Valley Harvest. I invited you, Mr. Furl, to the uh, store and you have come and I thank you for that. But there's one thing I haven't really told you, but except, except for the instant extreme theft, is the local drug dealers are. Uh, for the past three weeks, or I guess a whole month of July, every day when I go down to uh, Military Road, same guy, I won't say his name because I'm not a snitch, but um, he keeps offering me marijuana and other mar another drug use. Uh, I come from a family and who has been taking a lot of drug my father was an alcoholic. He's now a pastor. My brother is a drug addict. He's now in AA, in AA somewhere in Seattle. My other brother is a marijuana user, and I don't know where he is. Only one member of my entire family has graduated from high school and college, and she's now a prosecutor in the city of Los Angeles. I'm 16 years old. Uh, 
I fought many ways uh, to not become like how my siblings are. Uh, I have been trying to get into a lot of lost things as well. And I just want to make sure that a lot of my friends from high school get the same opportunities I've been getting. Because I know that guy, like I said, the drug dealer, he's been offering a lot of students, even who goes to TJ or Federal Way or any other high school, more drug use. So I'm asking you, please do something for the youth so that we don't become the next generation of homeless and drug users. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Juan. <clears throat> uh, we've got, uh, uh, Juan, we've got your contact information here. We'll follow up with uh, with your concerns about that particular location. Thank you. Dara Mandeville. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Am I allowed to read from an article? Is sure. that okay? Okay. I didn't know the rules. Um, so this is a Seattle Times article. It's not hard to find. It's dated... Um, uh, January 24th, 2022, because it was updated. So just the first paragraph. Dara, Dara, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. You've given us a little bit of prelude. I think it's dug into your time. Can we That's restart? Okay. Can we restart her time? I'm fast. There we go. That's okay. Well, okay. Let's, let's give you the full three. What do you <laughs> thank uh, you? you I appreciate that. You're up. The shooting that killed 23-year-old Anias Valencia and wounded her friend in a Seattle parking lot last February 2021 could have been turned, could have been prevented if the property owner and managers hadn't turned a blind eye to the gunman's violent tendencies and, and drug use, says two lawsuits filed on behalf of Valencia's family and the injured woman and a friend who witnessed the shooting. And I'm not going to read the whole article. It's Seattle Times. This young gal, 23 years old, her life was cut short on a property that's owned and managed by Urban League. That, that litigation is still pending right now for wrongful death. This gentleman, I went and did some research, re research sorry. Um, I mean, it, his, his rap sheet is longer than I am tall. Um, this is a man whose um, crimes were kind of just looked over. Um, and I went back and I requested police reports and got all the information. This man shouldn't have been on the streets nor should he have been in a facility, living in a facility that my tax dollars are paying for. The reason I bring this up is in the end of last year, in January of this year, in this exact room, this room was packed with people who were upset about the extended stay. And in, at, in the January meeting, we were told, give us six months, come back in six months. We're going to talk about um, council bill 820 about the licensing requirements for extended stay, what we're gonna require as citizens of this city and leaders of this city for the, I understand that this is a King County property and trust me, I've heard it a thousand times. We can't do anything, insert bad word. This is our city. We already have, I mean, anybody can look up the police, you know, the police calls in our city. It's public information. Friday night, there were 11 calls that nobody could respond to because our officers were too busy. We cannot allow somebody to come into this city and run a, a facility with, they've never run um, a, a, a health through housing property before. And they're, they're pending litigations for, um, for wrongful death. Why were, I understand that, you know, it was this, the county and the county made the decisions. I spoke with Sarah with the city and she said she was kind of part of it, but not really. W when do we get to decide what happens in our city? Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Um, so, Ryan, uh, we we did pass Council, Council Bill 820. Is that right? Uh, later. I mean, didn't didn't we? Uh, yes. Why don't we do this? I, thank you, Dara, for your comments. We always try to be responsive and not just listen and then move on. Um, maybe at our next meeting, we could just have a brief presentation uh, during emerging issues and report about what was the result of, of 820, just so we have, so we could uh, put a period at the end of that sentence, cross the T, dot the I, okay? Is that okay with everybody? Well, also, yeah. If, yeah. is there anything, anything that we can do to hold their feet to the fire? Because if we've got open drug use going on in that facility, mm -hmm. it's going to be spilling out into our community and it's going to cause a problem, just as it is doing down at uh, the other hotels along Peck Highway. That's right. I think that's contained there. So why don't we do this? Uh, Ryan and Brian will have, uh, we'll decide between uh, either of you, uh, maybe uh, Brian, okay, 
uh, the uh, uh, and then let's talk about that. Let's let's have this as a presentation. So uh, thank you, Dara. We'll we'll follow up. Um, I would note. Um, oh, also, uh, Chief, at the next meeting, um, or actually, uh, could you maybe respond later to um, uh, to uh, Ms. Mandeville's concerns about uh, Friday eight four and let, let, let's just note that. And if you can get back to her, I've got we've got her contact information here, obviously about eight calls that were not responded to. Oh, I'm sorry, 11 calls that were not responded to on 8-4. If you could look, could you look into that, please? I'd like to know what they were, what the what situation was. Okay. Oh, well, we'll get it. Right. We'll, we'll be in touch, Dara. Thank you very much. Um, and then uh, you could spread, you could put that out as, as you like, or if we, if you want us to report back at the next meeting, we will as well. Also, there was a, a, a question about putting out the staff information regarding uh, the operation and maintenance facility for the parks and public works. I believe we had a staff report that was available on, online uh, or in the materials. Uh, is that right? Okay. Was that, did that contain our PowerPoint or is that a matter of, 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 of public record or was the PowerPoint provided? The PowerPoints are added after the meeting because they're presented at the meeting. So we don't have them prior. Um, but, but the, the staff packet is, yeah. The, could you say it louder, please, for everybody? Sorry. The packet is uploaded, uploaded Friday before the Tuesday meeting. The PowerPoint that's presented at the meeting is then added to those presentation materials after the meeting. The morning, the morning following the meeting, everything's uploaded. Okay. All right. So if you've got to see, if you see something that is coming up on the agenda and you have concerns about maybe you don't quite know what's going on and you can't find it online because uh, it should be posted the Friday before, reach out to one of us or the city clerk and we'll try to get you everything we've got. Now, what, that I think there's a good point there. Um, uh, Su uh, Susan, I, it's Susan, right, that raised that issue? Yeah, yeah Susan. Um, that the PowerPoints are done in the days leading up to that. So if anybody... Uh, uh, we try to make those available. Uh, you know, they're they're done to help sort of with the presentations, but they're you know they're usually based on what's what's in the report. So we'll do a better job. I don't think routinely we put the powerpoints online or or if, as part we of the report. Started, we started doing that about a year or so ago, maybe two years ago. We do our adding the powerpoints onto the same folder. Yeah. Okay. So you have the agenda, the minutes, the packet, and the presentations all available online. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Branch. Thank you uh, very much. Oh, did we have a comment online? We do have uh, Ian Morrison signed up to speak, so he would be next. And yep. we do have someone with their hand raised online too, so we could take. We'll do that in. next. Okay. okay. Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Thank you, members of the council and Mayor Farrell. This is Ian Morrison. I'm a land use attorney with McCullough Hill Leary. I reside in Seattle, but I'm here speaking on behalf of Merlone Geyer Partners which owns the commons at Federal Way. And I am here on behalf of Merlone Geyer to speak in support to the resolution under consideration this evening on school impact fees. Merlone Geyer, as you know, owns the common. We're very excited. Thank you, Mayor, for the shout out about the Amazon Fresh. Very excited about the opportunities and innovations happening at the commons. And we are really uh, want to applaud both the school district and the city council for your consideration um, of the school impact fee uh, resolution this year. We applaud staff. We think this is a step in the right direction to support new housing options uh, in the city of Federal Way. Um, and so we would encourage the council's consideration of this. This is a, a something that we think is going to have a market impact on the uh, the amount of housing that will become viable uh, to move forward in the city of Federal Way. Uh, we would encourage one additional item for consideration by staff and council, which is for transformative sites like the commons at Federal Way, uh, these are sites that if they are to re redevelop in the vision of the city center, take long multi-phase uh, planning efforts and entitlement efforts. And as you're well aware, school impact fees are set annually and are paid only at the time of building permit issuance. And so while this is a step in the right direction for major transformative projects like the potential for city center uh, um, type development at the Commons of Federal Way, including multiple housing and retail options, um, we would encourage the city to consider some type of predictability process. So for major transformational projects like uh, the potential redevelopment of the commons, we could have some predictability over the long term that the school impact fees would not vacillate up and down year over year. So again, we think this council resolution is an excellent step forward. We would encourage the city to think um, creatively about what you may do to provide predictability over the long term for projects like the potential redevelopment of housing 
at the Commons um, to provide that predictability and help bring that project forward on a, um, an expedited basis. So we appreciate this step forward. We look forward to working with the council, the mayor and staff uh, to continue to work on a creative solutions to bring Center Center's better vision to fruition. Thank you, mayor and council. All right, thanks Ian. And we did see uh, an email previously. I, I think it was from, um, uh, uh, it was from Jameis, I believe, um, uh, from uh, Merlon Geyer. So thank you. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, uh, and then we have a hand raised. We have a hand raised Thank online you, for Josh Kim. If Thomas would unmute him. Could you say that again, please? Josh Kim is online. So okay. has his hand raised. Thomas is going to unmute him. All right, Josh, the floor is yours. Hello there, city council members, um, Mayor Farrell. I don't really have my thoughts uh, written out, so sorry if I'm all over the place. Um, I live in Federal Way. I live on uh, Ridgecrest Motel. I'm the manager there. I took a walk down Pacific Highway last night. I noticed a lot of stores with broken glasses and a lot more people out in front of like East Wind motels and those basically the motels you guys already know about with high crime areas. Um, I'm not too sure what we as a community can do. I wish that we would be more vigilant. If you see something, say something. Um, we can't really rely on the police to show up on time. Incidents and major crimes happen within seconds, sometimes even minutes. And I'm always worried about the elderly and uh, the women. When you look at the crime statistics uh, on King County South, that's provided in the uh, Washington Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs, better way is actually doing a little worse than the whole county. Uh, in terms of murder, it's gone up. In terms of kidnapping, it's gone up. And, and as the gentleman said before, what can we do besides keep saying, oh, give money to the police, ask for the police help. They can only do so much in so little time. Uh, we don't have the time right now for them to grow, to train, to be more experienced. Um, so we as a community should come together, do something. Uh, we as Americans have access to firearm rights. We have access to training for those. Uh, and when it comes to defense of your home, there is no duty to retreat. You can defend yourself, your business, uh, your home, life and limb. Um, so if anyone wants to go towards that option, please make sure you have training, you have backup, um, CCTV recording, um, because in my opinion, the prosecutor and the judges, there are several here in this county that really do not want civilians to protect themselves, law-abiding citizens. Um, um, for helping our youth, I think having extra, a lot of extracurricular activities available that are free, just like the skate park ideas that they were talked about uh, last meeting, those are great um, and would really help avoid uh, gang recruitment and drug, drug activity for the youth. As far as the adults though, uh, I don't know. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you so much. Okay, uh, is there any other uh Public comment? No one else online, Mayor. We did receive six written comments from Susan Overton, Holly Rose, Rachel Utera, Alex Anthony, Victoria Zeitler, and Kathleen Zabel regarding Steel Lake Annex and uh, against the maintenance facility. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. All right. Uh, thank you all so much for your public comment. It is clearly the most important thing we do is we, we acknowledge we, uh, we work for you. All right. Uh, Number five, presentations. Item A, proclamation for National Farmers Market Week, uh, Federal Way Farmers Market. Oh, uh, we'll have Deputy Mayor uh, Honda Reed and present to the uh, market volunteer, Vicki Chenoweth. You can see Vicki in front row. So Vicki, do you want to go to the podium and I'll read the proclamation and bring it down to you? Vicki is also, she's a volunteer, but she's also a sponsor of the market. So she puts her money where she believes it should go in Federal Way. Thank you. Proclamation, National Farmers Market Week. Whereas farmers markets continue to provide access to safe and nutritious food in the face of market disruptions, 
while also shortening supply chains and reinforcing a competitive food system benefiting producers and consumers. And whereas the U.S. Department of Agriculture recognizes the importance of expanding regional agricultural marketing opportunities that improve access to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, increase access to healthy, locally grown foods, and promote a more direct distribution of food to individuals and in institutions, thereby reducing the overall climate impact of our supply chain. And whereas farmers markets have evolved to serve as a set of vital hubs for rediscovering community, helping rural and urban communities reconnect with one another, and creating more equitable economic opportunities. And whereas farmers markets embody the American spirit by contributing to the USDA's food system transformation framework to enhance and strengthen a fair, competitive, and resilient food system. And whereas for the last 19 years, the Federal Way Farmers Market has benefited our community in meeting these needs. Now, therefore, we, the undersigned mayor and council of the City of Federal Way, do hereby proclaim August 7th to the 13th, 2022, as National Farmers Market Week to promote awareness of farmers markets, essential contributions to American life, and encourage all citizens of the City of Federal Way to celebrate the bounty of our farmers markets, signed this ninth day of August 2022. If you're not aware, the farmer's market is open Saturdays from May through October in the parking lot at the Federal Way Commons behind where the old Macy's is and the new Amazon Fresh. And it's open from 9 to 3 every Saturday. So the mayor, um, council members, and the um, residents of Federal Way, on behalf of the Farmer's Market, we'd like to thank you for your support. Um, every week when um, you come out, you're not um, you know, bringing good food to your own tables, but you're also supporting those individuals that um, are, need to support their families with their wares. There's a lot of, of good farmers there. There's a lot of, of craftsmen there. So if you have not, come to the farmer's market this Saturday would be your opportunity. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, now we've got recognition of an outstanding effort in support of the inclusion program. Uh, uh, Parks Deputy Director Jason Gerwin will introduce and present to Ms. Shelley Kane. Uh, can I have Ms. Shelley Kane and family come up? And um, full disclosure, uh, John Hutton, uh, Parks Director, and our Inclusion Coordinator, uh, Kevin Hutchinson, are on much-deserved vacations, and so I'm getting the honor to um, present this to uh, Ms. Shelley Kane, and um, I feel like I know you because uh, they have talked so highly about you and uh, the importance and the support for the Inclusion Program, and so I appreciate your council support in uh, signing this recognition, but... Um, we wanted to recognize the selfless and uh, act of charity that Shelley, uh, a parent and participant of Friendship Theater, and an amazing ambassador of the inclusion program. Not only did uh, Kane Gasket and Bolt, that's the business that her uh, Shelley and her husband own, not only did they sponsor Friendship Theater, um, but Shelley took it upon herself to add a fundraising component this year uh, to Friendship Theater. And what she did is she graciously purchased wine glasses and water bottles and imprinted them with the, the Friendship Theater logo, set up a stand and sold them at the four performances. Uh, I know at least two were sold out, the other two were close. Um, and um, fundraising for that program. And so, you know, she spent her time and effort to raise over $1,500, which is a big deal and a big impact for the inclusion program. And so this fun, fundraiser goes directly to the participants, uh, providing more programs and opportunities uh, for developmental and intellectual disabilities who value the social and life skills and programs provided through the inclusion program that Kevin Hutchinson runs. And so we presented this to council and they have graciously signed 
uh, the Certificate of Recognition and is presented to Shelley Kane tonight on behalf of the elected officials and residents of Federal Way, Washington, in recognition for your outstanding efforts in support of Friendship Theater Program. Thank you for spending countless hours of your time and helping raise over $1,500 during the theater performance, signed by Mayor Farrell, Council President Honda, and all the council members. And so, Shelley, we can't thank you enough for your support with the Inclusion Program and Friendship Theater, and happy to present you this certificate tonight. Yeah. If you'd like to say a few words, please feel free. Thank you so much. Well, it was indeed my pleasure. I love this community. I don't live here, but I have to tell you, council members and parks department, not all communities do what you guys do, including my own, for the kids that I love. And there's a lot of them. And um, when the pandemic first began, we didn't know what was going to happen. The world seemed to shut down overnight. And my son, Brandon, who has autism, he was scared and broken. And my mama heart was broken too. I wanted so desperately to reassure him that things were gonna be okay. But not long after that, the Federal Way Community Center rallied for all of us. Kevin Hutchinson and Sharon Boyle and all of the amazing staff members gave us light after dark. We got to do Zoom play practice, which we weren't always good at. <laughs> We saw friends and talked and shared and laughed, and we were reminded that we were not alone. We got to practice the play that had been so important to us. Then there was Sit and Fit and Monday meetups. Kevin even included us in a Zoom talent show one morning. Walking club started up, and we stayed six feet apart, but with our community. Most cities do not rally like you guys did. We're so proud of you, council members and Parks Department. You showed us that what matters to us so much truly matters to you too. We are forever grateful. Your community center programs offer so much to our families. Everyone from the top staff members to the girl running the coffee stand is so patient and kind. Even when one of us is taking a full seven minutes to decide between the apple and the Skittles. And Leslie can tell you it's always the extra hot mocha. <laughs> they just love us through it. Inclusion and enrichment are valuable to all people. Thank you so much for creating a, a community that shows us every day that we're worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. All right, thank you. And thank you, Jason. Okay, item six, uh, council committee and regional committee reports. First, Parks, Recreation, Human Services, uh, Public Safety Committee. Uh, that is Council Member Walsh. Oh, normally we would have been having the, uh, our committee meeting this evening. However, because of the rescheduling of the uh, of our uh, council meeting to this week because of National Night Out last week, we are not having it this month. And so we have not met since our last, uh, last com uh, council meeting. We will be meeting again on September 13th. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we have uh, asked staff and our last meeting to work on uh, on putting together the proposal for the shopping cart program. And we will be getting with staff also to give some, some suggestions on that preparation as well. Uh, since we were uh, not here last week at the, our meeting, we were some of us were out at National Night Out. It was very successful. Uh, I and some of the other council members were there as well, uh, along with the mayor. I visited seven of the National Night Out celebrations and they were wonderful uh the food was good too that's appreciated and uh and it, I, I wish i could have made it all i think 24 of them that were were registered but it was great being there and i want to uh do a shout out to the community for uh doing a wonderful job with, with uh, national night out and and working on bringing the community together thank you all right thank you very much all right uh, now land use transportation committee uh councilman Adobe. Yes, uh, our next meeting is going to be September 5th, 2022. Uh, do I have that wrong there? You looked at me it's funny. The, I think it's the 12th because of the holiday. The 12th, the holiday. My, my iPad lied to me tonight. <laughs> anyway, it's on the 12th. Misinformed me. Um, and most of the things on the consent agenda came out of land use. Um, and I do want to uh, thank the staff and the other council members uh, we will be later on talking about uh, school impact fees. That was a, uh, as we heard from the one person that called in, I think that's gonna be a great uh, thing for our city for development. 
and uh, the staff and the land use committee work very, very hard to get it to where it's going to be on the council tonight for a vote. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Finance, Economic Development and Regional Affairs Committee. Councilmember Tran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, our committee met on uh, July 26th and we approved the items B, C, D, E, and J on the consent, consent agenda for your consideration. Um, the committee also approved to move the interloan um, fund, interfund loan um, items to council business uh, for discussion and approval tonight. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to recognize uh, the good work uh, finance department is doing. Um, especially thank you, Steve and Chase, uh, for doing a great work. Uh, we just passed the uh, uh, financial uh, audit. Um, and uh, I talked to the um, auditors and uh, they are very happy uh, with um, everything that going on in the city. They have every confidence that we uh, manage the public funds uh, the best of our ability, and they have no concern. So thank you uh, for your leadership. I also want to recognize the finance department, not um, just to manage um, the money, but also to uh, invest our money. Uh, as of last month, July, we have earned one point, almost one point two million dollars in interest. That is a, you know, substantial amount of money. So thank you, um, finance staff, uh, for doing a great work. And as a reminder, uh, we don't have the meeting in August. Uh, this is our tradition, so that staff can spend time with uh, family um, and enjoy the summer. So. Our next meeting is going to be in September. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, uh, Council Member Asefa Dawson. Thank you, Mayor. Our meeting for tomorrow has been canceled. Our next meeting is September 14th at 10 a.m. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor, uh, Honda and Regional Committee's report. Thank you. The Senior Commission will be meeting next Wednesday from two to four here at City Hall, but I am very excited to say that um, our third printing of the senior brochure is finished and will be picked up tomorrow, ready for distribution um, next week. And I, I'd like to thank Still Lake, Still Lake Presbyterian Church for your financial contributions to that printing. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, next week, we will have four council members attending the budget workshop in Leavenworth, and I'm looking forward to that. All of the presenters are people I have not heard from, and so it'll be new information, and, and I think that we will all learn from that. And last week at National Night Out, my husband and I went around to, we, we hit seven places, Mayor, but we started at 4 wow. o'clock. <laughs> we always have a little uh, contest here to see who goes to more, uh, but we did start early, and I'd like to thank those neighborhoods who welcomed us into their um their gatherings and, and talked with us and shared with us their concerns and and uh, let us be part of their neighborhood for just a little while. I also want to remind everyone that this is our only meeting in August. Our next regular council meeting will be September 6th. And so uh, next week, which is the third Tuesday, we will not be here, but we are always available to contact even when we're not here. So. Please don't forget us uh, for the rest of August. Let us know what you're thinking, and we'll, we'll get back to you. Thank you. All right. Council President Kushmar. Thank you, Mayor. Well, <clears throat> we do have a wonderful community. We have a wonderful community of individuals who live here. We have a wonderful community of staff who work hard on your behalf. And it's so nice to have positive reports, for example, with National Night Out, with Camp Kilworth, if you've never been down to that property, um, Google it. A fabulous piece of property for the Boy Scouts. Working on that for 20 years, trying to get that secured for use by camping in the future. We almost lost it. Thank you to Mary Alice and all of her efforts. 
Uh, also, thank you to Friendship Theater as a grandmother of a special needs child. I know how important those types of activities are for children with special needs to feel included, to feel part of normal everyday activities. Um, and and they're, it helps them to develop, and they're special people with special, wonderful love for everybody. So if you ever need a special needs person, special needs child, give them a hug. Finally, there was a lot of talk this evening about what do we do about the crime that's going on? What do we do about what's going on in like rail? How scary that is when people are smoking fentanyl and it's in an enclosed space. What's going on in our community with drug use, with people, drug dealers approaching our children? And what can you do? What can we do? What you can do is change the legislation that's coming out of Olympia. That's what's causing the problem. That's what's causing the legal drug use. That's what's causing the emboldenment of people who feel that they can drive down a street, have a gun in their car, and shoot somebody right in front of the Federal Library. Honest to gosh, that where people feel that they can drive down the street, see a key in a car, which happened two nights ago, come back, steal the keys, come back later in the evening, and then take the car and feel that they're never going to get any time for that. We have a revolving door in our prosecuting attorney where they let people come and go 10, 20, 30 times. Thank you to the people in this community that are standing up for those problems, that are standing up for it right here in our own community. I just want to tell you that if you want to do anything, it's the legislation where it's all at. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now moving on to the consent agenda. These items have already gone through committee and can be passed all at once. I'll read them all and see if a council member wants them pulled for separate consideration. All right, item A, minutes for the July 19th, 2022 regular and special meeting minutes. B, monthly financial report, June 2022. C, AP vouchers, 6 16 22 through 7 15 22, and payroll vouchers, uh, June 1 22 through 6 30 22. D, tourism enhancement grant recommendations uh, for 2022. E, purchase of five copiers using replacement reserves. F, 2022 storm pipe repair project bid award. G, 27th Avenue Southwest at Southwest 344th Street, compact uh, roundabout 30% design report. H, Redondo Creek culvert replacement 30% design report. I, 2022 neighborhood traffic safety program revision. And J, Global Kitchen LLC, Doing business as K catering contract amendment number one. Council, would you, uh, are there any items that you would want pulled for separate consideration? Hearing none, Council President Coach Moore, do you have a motion? Thank you very much, Mayor. I move approval of items A through J on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. It's been a motion and a second to approve uh, A through J. Uh, is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Matters passed unanimously. Thank you very much. Now, public hearing, item eight. I'll now open the public hearing and read into the record the procedures to be followed. <clears throat> this is a quasi-judicial process. This is for the uh, former Bally's Property Development Agreement uh, Comprehensive Amendment and Rezone. The public hearing is now open for the proposed development agreement, comprehensive plan amendment, and associate, associated rezone for the former Bally's property. The purpose of this hearing is for the council to sit in its quasi-judicial capacity to hear and consider the pertinent facts relating to the application and one, grant, two, modify and, and grant, or three, deny the application. Council may wish to impose conditions and or restrictions on the proposed application. Everyone present will be given an opportunity to be heard later this evening. When you address council, please begin clearly state, please begin by clearly stating your name for the record. For those citizens wishing to comment, there are comment forms near the entrance, and I already have a few. Please fill out a form and hand it to the city clerk over here to my right. All comments should be relevant to the application and not of a personal nature. Because this hearing involves the rights of a specific party in a land use matter, it is being conducted in the council's quasi-judicial capacity, and it must be fair in form and substance, as well as in appearance. To that end, I will now ask council members questions to ensure the fairness of this proceeding. First, do any of the council members have an interest in the property or application or own property within 300 feet of the property subject to the application? No. No. Okay. I hear uh, all no. All right. 
Do any of the council members gain or lose any financial benefit as a result of the outcome of this hearing? No. 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 All right. Unanimously, no. Are there any council members who cannot hear and consider this matter in a fair and objective manner? Yeah. No. Okay. I hear unanimous no. Has any member of the council engaged in communication outside this hearing with opponents or proponents on the issue to be heard? No. Um, I have had discussions with some members of the community. Yeah, other than just discussions in general, there's nothing in particular. Right. Okay, yeah. so let me let me get to the second part of this, and we'll get it to get this on the record. If so, that council member will state for the record the substance of any such communication, so that other interest interested parties may have the right at this hearing to rebut the substance of the communication. Uh, yeah. Deputy Mayor, do you remember anything? Uh, it was with Jan Barber. It was just concerns. It was about a year ago. Okay. No, it's just substance. Just asking what's going on and and and. Where, where it's going next. It's just no substance at all. Okay. Yeah. And a few uh, members of the community have expressed displeasure with what was wanted, but I mean, no, once again, no, no substance. Okay. All right. And Mayor, just to add on to that, there are quite a few um, comments on this topic that have been made a public comment, and those have been summarized, and they are actually in the packet, um, but those were all made in open public meetings, and they've all been recorded. So, um, if anyone wants to read those, those are in the packet. Okay. All right. Now, moving on. Um, I would like to ask if there's anyone in the audience who objects to any council member's participation in these proceedings. Okay. I hear no, no response. Um, okay. Before hearing from the applicant, I'm going to introduce Associate Planner Natalie Kamenecki. Uh, who will present background information, documentation, and exhibits, as well as staff analysis of the application. Please hold your questions until after we conclude presentations and comments. Natalie? Um, one moment, please, while I... Uh, you should have a cake. Right, exactly. IT. Exactly. IT. And share screen. Uh, you're already done. I'm sharing. You're already doing that, so we'll just get you started here. Great. Good evening, Mayor Farrell, Council President Kochmar, and Deputy Mayor Honda, and um, all council members. Uh, my name is Natalie Kamenicki, and I am an associate planner that is resign, assigned the review of the 2021 Comprehensive Plan Amendment Rezone and Development Agreement for the site formerly known as the Bally's property. The request um, by the property owners, First Avenue South Apartments, um, is for a comprehensive plan amendment, rezone, and development agreement of the former Bally site, uh, parcel 172104-9038, which is a total of six acres. The site is located south of 328th Street and east of First Avenue South. The current designation is Office Park, OP, and the requested designation is multifamily uh, residential, specifically RM1800, which is 18, um, uh, one dwelling unit per 1800 square feet. The proposal includes a development agreement that allows uh, for townhouse development at this site and includes home ownership opportunities uh, through the recording of a condominium agreement. So a quick procedural summary on how we arrived at today. Um, the process was initially under the selection um, process for 2021. Uh, the Land Use Transportation Committee um, heard that request on June 7th, 2021, and recommended that it be added for further evaluation, and that was confirmed at the City Council public hearing on June 15th of 2021. 
Once the selection was confirmed by city council, the applicants um, submitted additional information for uh, the State Environmental Policy Act, SEPA, and a determination of non-significance was issued on July 30th of 2021. Uh, the comment period uh, for the SEPA ended August 13th, and the SEPA appeal period on September 15th of 2021. The project next went before uh, the Planning Commission for public hearing. Uh, the public hearing lasted uh, two days from September 15th and continued to their next regular meeting on October uh, the 6th. Um, and we will get into a little more detail on the Planning Commission public hearing in the future. Um, but through that meeting, uh, there was a um, determination that uh, a development agreement be submitted for review by the City Council to evaluate home ownership opportunities uh, within the development. So that leads us here to today. Uh, development agreement requires a public hearing before city council. And we are going to look at different aspects of the site um, as we continue on. So next up here, we can see what the existing zone classification looks like on the map. Um, again, it's zoned office park. Um, and we can see that the parcel is isolated from other office park zoning immediately to the southeast. Um, we can see that the surrounding zoning and uses are consistent with the RM 1800 to the north across 328th Street and also to the east um, is RM 1800. Directly to the south is also residential multifamily uh, 2400. Should the request be approved, the map would then look, um, as we see on this slide, um, with the RM1800 on the corner for the former uh, Bally's project, and it would be consistent with adjacent zonings um, and townhouse development uh, that is immediately adjacent to the north and to the east. Current site conditions include uh, the former Bally's Fitness Center. Uh, it is located in the southeast corner of the property um, and it's been vacant for several, several years. Um, so this is a view next here um, from South 3, 328th Street, um, looking at a portion of the building and um, uh, old pavement and other improvements um, that are deteriorating. This is also a photo of the existing building um, looking from 328th, South 328th Street um, looking south um, at some of the uh, old parking lot and um, vacant building. So we'll get into a little bit more physical data on the site. Our next slide is a critical areas map. Uh, the site is fairly level, um, only with maybe a few gentle sloping areas. Uh, there are no geologic hazards um, mapped or to be known on site, including no landslide hazard or erosion hazards. Uh, there are no fish and wildlife uh, mapped streams on or within proximity to the site. And there are no wetland um, indicators within 225 feet of the subject property. The site is located within a five-year wellhead protection capture zone and would require hazardous inventory material for any development on the site. In addition, all proposed uses, um, regardless of the rezone is approved or denied, would undergo drainage review for surface water runoff and control in accordance with the King County Surface Water um, Design Manual and the City of Federal Ways Addendum. Uh, the site would need full drainage review, including a level one downstream analysis. And the site also lies within a conservation flow control area and enhanced basic water quality. Uh, for any development on the site, a technical information report addressing the King County Surface Water Design Manual regulations would be required of the site. Access currently to the project is um, from both South 3... 28th Street and 1st Avenue. Uh, final development um, and optimum access points would be 
uh, designated during site-specific development applications. Um, at the time of a development application is submitted, the traffic division would conduct a transportation concurrency analysis um, to analyze peak hour trips and any impacts that would be outside of the city's uh, transportation improvement plan. Uh, development proposals would also be subject to traffic impact fees uh, to address system impacts. Um, additional site-specific analysis may be required um, to address any peak hour um, trips and safety issues. There are available uh, utilities at the site, including public sewer and public water. Um, facilities are located along First Street um, and uh, demonstrated within Exhibit O of your packets. Um, solid waste is provided by waste management. Uh, police, fire, and medical services currently serve the site and would be continuing to serve the property under future development. Um, and the school falls with it. And the school district, um, Federal Way School District, would serve that property um, with children um, mainly going to Mirror Lake Elementary School, Totem Middle School, and Todd Beamer High School. So the project has been in the works for uh, quite a while. There have been several different public comment periods where uh, members of the public have provided comments and adjacent property owners with their concerns on the development of the property. Um, there's been extensive public comment um, in opposition to the project uh, with some of the reasons um, cited as increased traffic congestion in the area. Um, uh, concerns over if the development would be low income and what the income level of the individuals um, in the units would be. Um, concerns over uh, whether or not those units would be rented or homeowner occupied. Um, there's a concern of uh, increased crime uh, among, other, among other concerns. Uh, they, we did receive several comment letters from the Moorish National Republic Federal Government, and they have stated they have rights to use the building and the underlying land. Um, we've also received some interest from members of the public uh, as far as alternative uses of the site and a wish um, that the building would return to a fitness center um, or potentially a market. Um, also, more recently, we've had interest um, in having it be more of an urban agricultural site with weekend farming and utilizing the existing building as almost like a secondary marketplace to um, sell surplus items from uh, people interested in doing urban agriculture and weekend farming. Uh, as the project has progressed, um, we've received several letters in support of the project from area uh, businesses and area resident. Um, I believe that was forwarded to you today um, as it was received after the staff report was completed. Um, but there's been support in having um, additional diverse housing type units um, and different type of home ownership opportunities uh, for growing families and um, uh, people that are looking for um, low, middle and high type uh, housing units. Um, which the townhouse development style um, supports that, that vision as well. So as mentioned, um, we held a, the planning commission held a public hearing on the matter. Um, this was held on September 15th of 2021 and also on October 6th of 2021. The planning commission received staff presentation um, and subsequent public comments regarding the proposal. Uh, following the input um, and deliberations of the uh, Planning Commission, uh, the Planning Commission ultimately recommend, quote, that the proposed comprehensive plan amendment not be adopted until such time that the applicant and the city enter into a development agreement pursuant to our uh, Federal Way Revised Code 19.85 to cover home ownership opportunities and other items deemed appropriate by the city council. Subsequent to the planning commission public hearing, the applicants did reach out to area neighbors um, prior to submitting a 
uh, development agreement in an effort to satisfy the Planning Commission recommendation. Um, the development agreement provides market rate townhouses um, and a recording of a, a condominium community within 60 days of issuance of the certificates of occupancy. Um, each uh, townhome uh, could be sold and transferred without any barriers with that provision um, included. Uh, however, it does not limit the property owner to um, decide whether the units would be rental or uh, ready to be sold. And that would be um, an aspect of uh, what the market conditions are, are, are allowing. Uh, there will be dedicated garage parking. Each townhouse will have a garage and two um, parking stalls associated. Um, each unit will be accessing their own open space, um, private open space in the um, form of either a balcony or outdoor area. Um, and the any amenities building constructed um, associated with the complex would be architecturally consistent with the um, project as a whole. A few development modifications are also being approved, also being proposed for approval with this development agreement. Um, each townhouse again will have two garage parking stalls. Uh, guest parking would be surface parked and provided at one stall per six dwelling unit. Um, minimum required separation between structures uh, at 10 feet. And also the benefits and obligations of this development agreement will run with the land um, and continue regardless of subdivision leasing or transfer of ownership for a term of 10 years. So at this time we are going to switch gears a little bit into uh, factors and criteria uh, that are looked at when providing recommendation for this type of a, of a proposal. Um, so we will first start with Federal Way Revised Code 19.80140. And I will briefly summarize uh, this section of the staff report. Um, first being the effect upon the physical environment. Um, there should be no adverse effect on the physical environment related to the development of this property. Um, regardless of the zoning, uh, there are environmental uh, regulations and codes in place to protect the environment. Um, there are also no mapped wetlands, fish and wildlife, geologic hazards um, on the property. Um, for number two, the effect of open space streams and lakes. Again, there are no streams or lakes located on the property. Um, each townhouse would be uh, providing dedicated open space areas um, as required through uh, the design standards of the City of Federal Way. Uh, that the use is compatible and it, with an impact on adjacent land use and surrounding neighborhoods is identified. The existing comprehensive plan and zone designation of OP at this site is currently um, significantly isolated from uh, the large portion and swath of OP to the southeast. Uh, the current comprehensive plan and zoning uh, of the adjacent properties are all multifamily residential, including the zone classification in which uh, is proposed in the uh, comprehensive plan amendment rezone and development agreement. So if approved, it would result in a contiguous um, area of uh, residential multifamily zoning um, at that location and consistent with the existing land use patterns of the community. Uh, adequate uh, public facilities and um, impacts to roads and transportation parks, recreation and schools. Um, all utilities are located at the property. Um, and there are also a wide variety of recreational opportunities throughout um, Federal Way. And there will also be dedicated open space for the residents on site um, to recreate. The benefit to the neighborhood region. Um, at present, we've had several discussions over time, I think as a city with uh, lack of housing opportunities, um, and diversity in those housing opportunities, trying to catch up with um, our growing population and forecasting numbers that have been identified in our housing action plan. Um, the uh, new 
if proposed, the development agreement would provide um, townhouses, which are specifically called out as being a land use and an opportunity for um, uh, bridging the gap between missing middle type uh, residential units. Um, also, the uh, development of this property would displace a long um, vacant and abandoned structure, um, which there have been no um, new commercial applications presented uh, to redevelop the um, existing vacant structure. Uh, it would also um, uh, displace uh, the vacant structure and um, be rid of a perhaps attractive nuisance for trespassing or vandalism or other types of um, uh, use, unauthorized user activity at, at the site. Um, and the property would then become a, a benefit to the tax base as it redevelops and has a purposeful use again at, the, at that corner. Um, Quantity and location of land plan for the proposed land use and density. Um, the request could result in much needed residential units. Uh, the federal way housing target 11,260 units before 2024 um, to accommodate the population growth and forecast. Um, based on the housing action plan and the housing action forecast map, which are included as exhibit H and I in your exhibit packets, um, shows that there would be capacity in this area for additional units um, to create um, a diverse housing choice and um, expanding on uh, closing the gap between missing middle um, type housing units and uses. The current population density um, would allow for one unit per 1800 square feet um, and could yield up to 145 units. Um, as identified in the housing action plan, um, the area in general can accommodate this type of growth. Um, and approval of the uh, comprehensive plan and rezone and development agreement would not have any uh, negative or effect on any other aspects of the comprehensive plan. This next section, uh, criteria for amending the comprehensive plan. Uh, Number one, the proposed amendment bears a substantial relationship to public health, safety, or welfare. Um, the change would create a multifamily residential um, development and would be a benefit to the public health, safety, and welfare uh, to provide additional housing costs um, to different and different diversity of housing availability to um, uh, different segments of the population trying to get into um, different types of housing units um, and create uh, and create uh, needed uh, more opportunity to get their their foot in the game, I guess to to put it that way of um, creating a missing middle so people can move up in their different. Uh, ideas of, of where they want to live um, and also meet the expectant population growth goals. Um, the proposed amendment um, is in the best interest of the city as described in previous sections of the staff report. Um, it will facilitate housing units, expand diversity and housing choices, um, broaden the uh, close the gap between missing middle housing options um, and return the site to a functional use, um, displacing a long vacant building um, and removing uh, the potential for an attractive nuisance of trespassing or vandalism uh, and things of that nature. Uh, the proposed amendment is consistent with the requirements of uh, the Growth Management Act. Um, so that would be promoting uh, urban growth and development within urban areas where adequate public facilities and services exist, such as the Valley site. Um, it would also serve to reduce sprawl um, and uh, keep residential units um, within uh, the city. 
uh, and it would also encourage the availability of uh, housing uh, to all economic segments of the population. The proposal is also consistent with the following goals and policies of the comprehensive plan. Um, there are several listed, um, and I won't read them all verbatim to you, um, but housing policy um, number two, amend the regulations to accommodate a diverse range of housing that would be compatible with the neighborhood and character. Uh, housing goal two, involve the community in the development of new housing to a degree that is consistent with the scale and impact of the surrounding neighborhoods. And, else, and also housing policy 10, encourage community input where appropriate to the development permit process by providing uh, thorough and timely information. Um, housing goal four, proactively plan for and respond to trends in housing demand. Um, housing goal 16, increase capacity and encourage greater diversity of housing types um, and cost for both infill and new development through various methods. Um, such as inclusionary zoning, density bonuses, and transfer of development rights. Um, there are no uh, transfer of development rights associated with this, but we, uh, but this proposal would allow for um, a missing middle and um, type of housing that can benefit um, a wide range of individuals looking for housing. Uh, land use goal one, create an attractive, welcoming, functional built environment. Um, returning the site to a functional use would um, would meet that criteria and is certainly consistent with that criteria. Um, uh, land use policy eight, designate and zone land to provide for federal ways. Share of regionally adopted demand for the forecast of residential, commercial, and industrial uses over the next 20 years, um, which additional units um, are needed um, as per the um, the housing action plan um, findings. And finally, provide a wide range of housing types and densities um, uh, with market to ban, with, within the market to ban and uh, the housing targets for the community and their preference, um, which townhouse was certainly top preference when it came to um, different uh, public comment um, received by area neighbors and general public in general. Um, next, we will move on to uh, Federal Way Revised Code 19751303A. Uh, the city may approve an application for quasi-judicial non-project rezone only if it finds that I, the proposed rezone is in the best interest of the city of Federal Way and the proposed rezone is appropriate either because um, conditions in the immediate vicinity of the project have so significantly changed since the pro property was given that's present zoning that under those changed conditions, a rezone within is within the public interest, um, which is the reason um, that we are uh, supported with that the rezone is supported under. Um, the other option would be that it would be a um, error in the city's zoning map, which this uh, case is not applicable. So uh, the conditions in the immediate vicinity and um, have, have changed significantly over time. Um, office park, uh, office uses are, are more considerably vacant at, at present, um, due to changing times, um, the need for housing units um, and diverse housing units is uh, is extremely important to uh, the community and people looking uh, for home ownership opportunities or rental opportunities. Um, the proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, the parcel right now is a standalone office park um, and is completely surrounded by multifamily residential zoning and consistent um, stacked units and or attached single family such as townhome. Um, the uh, project is consistent with the comprehensive plan under the same um, land use housing uh, policies that I just uh, just read to to you all. Uh, the requested rezone of office park is appropriate in this location and consistent with the surrounding uses and the underlying zone classifications and consistent <laughs> with the public health, safety, and welfare 
as the property would uh, return to a functional use, provide additional housing units within City of Federal Way, and diversify the housing stock that we have available. Okay. The factors to be considered through a uh, development agreement uh, would be the compatibility and impact on adjacent um, and surrounding neighborhoods. Um, the development agreement provides uh, market rate residential units uh, that will be constructed as townhomes, which is consistent with the adjacent land use patterns. Um, that the adequacy of and the impact of community facilities, utilities, roads, public transportation, parks, recreation, and schools um, is identified. Um, the facilities are adequate um, at the site and as discussed uh, previously in this uh, report and can accommodate future uh, development of the property as requested in the comprehensive plan amendment, rezone, and accompanying uh, development agreement. Uh, the benefits to the of the proposal to the community, again, would displace a long vacant building and return a uh, six acre property to functional use. Um, it is, uh, the project is consistent with housing action plan goals um, and uh, would promote new market rate and affordable housing construction and also increase the diversity in housing choice through expanded missing middle development opportunities. Townhomes are explicitly identified as missing middle um, building typology. And again, the proposal will have no other effect on other aspects of the community plan. Uh, based upon the analysis and the findings and conclusion, the Department of Community Development uh, Services recommends approval of the proposed comprehensive plan amendment, rezone, and development agreement. And that concludes um, my presentation for you tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Oh, no, you're fine. Okay, we'll do the questions after the public comments. We're going to get everything in, and then we're going to do the questions. Um, Okay, uh, Natalie, great job, thank you. We're gonna follow up with questions in just a few minutes. Uh, my understanding is, um, I see Eric Labrie, the uh, uh, engineer uh, for the project. Um, so uh, the applicant or applicant's representative is here tonight. Um, uh, uh, Eric and the uh, any other representatives of the, uh, uh, of the owner and the applicant are welcome to come to the podium, introduce themselves for the record um, and, and be heard by the council. I thought I had it in show. Okay. I will be right. Could you maximize the window? And uh, let me just uh, clarify real quick. Are we on a, a, a time restriction for the applicant's presentation or not? Okay. I just wanted to make sure about that. Eric, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. My name is Eric Labrie. I'm the president of ESM Consulting Engineers. They, uh, we're located here in the city of Federal Way, and I'm here tonight to represent the landowner and the applicant for this uh, request that's before you this evening, with the comprehensive plan and rezone request. Now with me also is Liz Soldano from Intercorp. She'll be speaking more about the uh, development agreement and about what they're proposing with the site. So um, just to back up for a second, um, we want to thank staff for helping us for the last two years devise something that is before you tonight that we feel brings a great benefit to the city. Um, and, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with them, and, and it's been a long road to get here. So tonight is an opportunity for you to grant new life to a property that's seen much better days. Um, a little bit more history on the property. The Valley site was built in the mid-70s as part of Weyerhaeuser's West Campus development, and it predates the city of Federal Way. So it was built under King County jurisdiction, and um, one could only imagine when the city leaders were incorporating and thinking about zoning, what should you zone this parcel? And if you notice, the parcel is zoned. It's not an area, it's an individual parcel. So they chose a zoning that fit the use of that time. And Valley's served this community well for decades. And um, unfortunately, 
in about 2010, 2011, they fell on hard times, as a lot of companies did, and they were bought out by LA Fitness, who came in and they tried to run the facility for a few more years before they shut the doors for good. So that site has been vacant for at least seven years, providing no benefit to the city, no benefit to the residents. You know, Bally's employed people from the community. Bally's provided tax revenue. Bally's provided recreational opportunities. And that site has been nothing. It's been for sale. Unfortunately, there are no developers that want to breathe life into this site under the current zoning. And that's why two years ago, the landowner contacted us and asked us, asked us to put forward a request to rezone it. By itself, the rezone is a little bit hard to swallow sometimes. We get that. And luckily, along the way, Intercorp came along and they proposed something that met a lot of goals, that met everything that we thought that city needed. So we put together this well-balanced, well-thought-out proposal to provide missing middle-income housing for the city of Federal Way, to return a site to a benefit to the city and provide tax revenue along the way. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the comprehensive plan or rezone portion of it, but I'd like to invite Liz Soldano from uh, Intercorp to talk about who they are as developers and what they're proposing for the site. So thank you. All right, Ms. Soldano. Uh, we'll need the IT folks here for a second. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Here he comes. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, it's happy to help. <clears throat> and I, you may remember everybody that uh, I said we we're going to break at eight thirty. We. Uh, as soon as Ms. Saldono is done with her presentation, we'll break uh, for about 10 minutes. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna break at 8:30. We had planned to take a uh, a 10 minute break. At 8:30, we're gonna we're gonna break for 10 minutes. Then we'll take public comment. We will take public comment. Well, thank you for your time. My name's Liz Soldano with Intercorp Homes. And Intercorp, as Eric had said, we work jointly with Widener and the city planning staff to um, on the development agreement that accompanies the rezone that's under consideration this evening. Natalie, thank you for presenting the staff report. I'm not going to repeat um, everything that Natalie did, but we would like to take a few moments to um, tell you a little bit about Intercorp what we're proposing to build, and then to summarize the benefits a project like this will bring to the neighborhood and the city of Federal Way. So a little bit about Intracorp. So for over 30 years, we've been building high quality residential market rate housing throughout the Pacific Northwest region. Re markets that we work in are well established, including Seattle, Bellevue, Redmond, and Issaquah. We like to be in Federal Way because like its sister cities, it's rich in lifestyle amenities and it has excellent transportation on the I-5 corridor. And that will be even better with the addition of the light rail in 2024. So as you saw, here's a picture of the site and the Bally's building is in the background. It's been vacant for seven plus years. And the site is blighted. And in the foreground, what you see is part of the expansive parking lot pavement that covers the rest of the site. And this conceptual site plan here represents a redeveloped townhome community. Common areas site design will include landscaping, outdoor spaces to gather and play, sidewalks, site lighting, and other features that will foster community and neighborhood safety. And in addition, but not obvious from this um, as a site feature, will be an engineered detention system to control site stormwater runoff.
As stated in the staff report, this proposed development supports the city's housing action plan to add missing middle housing. These will be high quality market rate, two, three, and four bedroom family style townhomes with two car tuck under garages, private entries, and yards. Interiors will be light and bright with modern finishes featuring hard surface countertops, stainless steel appliances, quartz countertops, and master suites with walk-in closets. And of course, these are all the goodies that you find in single family homes. I said I'd be brief, so uh, I'm, I'm concluding here. Um, to wrap up my summary of the benefits with, of this project, the benefits of this project um, to, the, to the neighborhood and the city of Federal Way. This project will enhance the neighborhood character by replacing blight with a thriving high quality market rate residential development. New construction, construction valuation will enhance the value of the neighboring homes and the assessed value of property will increase from the current value of 2.5 million to plus 70 million. With this, we ask the city council to approve, approve the proposed comp plan amendment, rezone and DA. And again, we thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you very much, Ms. Saldana. All right, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, we are gonna take a 10 minute recess uh, of just for uh, council and people to um, I'm going to set the timer at 10. Uh, please, Council, let's be back right at 10 minutes. Um, and yes, I do. Yeah, thank you very much. And the Council President, I've conferred with the Council President and the, and the Deputy Mayor. Let me just have everybody's attention real quick. Can I have your attention real quick? It may be while, while you're here. Can I have your attention real quick? Excuse me. Excuse me. So what I have, what I want to make sure, it's my job to make sure that we run on time, but I also want to make sure that if anybody here is here for a particular item, that you don't wait to the end of the uh, calendar, because what I'm going to be suggesting, right now we're at 8.30. We're going to be back at 8.40. Um, and uh, we've got the last item on our agenda before council reports is a discussion on ARPA priorities. It is not calendared for a vote tonight. I think based on everything else on our calendar, I think it's going to be a later evening. I think by the time we get to this, it's going to be after 10 p.m. It is my suggestion that we push this to September since there is no voting on it. But I didn't want anybody to be sitting in that audience um, waiting to discuss this or, or hear about it. So, uh, Council, is there any objection to essentially when we get to item E, pushing this to the next meeting since we're not voting on it anyway? I'm ready for a fight, so... Okay. Okay. So that's the plan. There is no, we were not planning on voting for that. I want to let everybody know that's, that's going to be the plan. Um, but uh, if no action is taken, uh, then that. So we are, I will start the timer for 10 minutes. It's 826. At 836, we will reconvene. Thank you for your patience.
Right. Okay, um, uh, at this time, the floor is open for comments from the audience. All comments may, must be addressed to the council, relevant to the application, and not of a personal nature. When I call your name, please come to the podium and state your name. Kenneth Pratt. After Mr. Pratt, it'll be Alexander Milstein, Carolyn Davis, and Jan Barber. Um, Mr. Uh, Mayor, Council, and others, uh, my name is Kenneth Pratt. Um, I'm a longtime resident uh, of Federal Way. I live in Colonial Forest, just north of and directly across 328th from this property. Um, I'm not against the rezone, like I'm sure many people are, but I'm not. But I have some concerns that I don't think we're, I, I think the staff tried to, to do this stuff, and I hope that, that there's follow up after you approve this by the traffic department and, and others involved in this process, because we have a situation with the way that their plot plan is laid out. They're gonna put a driveway directly across from our back driveway, Colonial Forest. Um, so there's gonna now be a four, four way intersection on uh, South 328. South 328 for us is a crapshoot getting on it with just no traffic coming across the street but because it's hard to see on um, both ways coming out of our driveway. So it's a, add another element across the street. It's gonna be an issue for us and for the new residents. Hmm. Um, in addition to that, I don't think anybody's thought about it, but Federal Way School di uh, District picks up and drops off kids at our back gate. Um, and in the fall, uh, you know, it's raining, it's dark. There's kids crossing the street from the units that are directly uh, west of it or no, directly east of it. They're crossing the street to get over to the school stop. Um, and that's gonna be an issue with more cars. You're gonna add another 200 and some cars to this area that are gonna be going in and out uh, early in the morning and stuff. So I just want you to look at that, consider, and I hope that, 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 that that's followed up with some uh, after afterward by the staff. Um, the other thing I'd really like to see is is this this complex is a is a owner uh, occupied complex, not a rental, not a transient. Um, I think there's more pride, and, and, and I think that's better for the city um, than a rental property. So that's that's about that's all I've got. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. Yeah. Okay, Alexander Milstein. Hello, I'm Alexander Milston. I also live in Colonial Forest, just north of this property. I believe that the best use of the former Bailey property would be rezoning it into a mixed use property, meaning that the property would include both residential and commercial aspects to it. This change could be done with little alterations to any existing design plans while still having a significantly positive effect. The main positive effect that would come from this change would be that the shops on the property would have a solid stream of customers and the residents of the property would be very close to the businesses. This would be beneficial to the residents, the businesses, the local, the local neighborhood, and the city. Being able to walk to local businesses, in addition to practically guaranteeing local customers for the businesses, can also save the locals money on transportation costs and improve their general health through the moderate exercise. In addition, it would benefit the neighborhood by making the area more pedestrian friendly and improve sales to the local, to the local business would provide a big increase to the property's tax revenue from having the, prof the profitable businesses. Zoning it exclusively as residential would not be a good idea. As someone who lives next to the former Bailey property, I can tell you that there's a major lack of commercial buildings in that area. It takes half an hour of walking to get from the former Bailey property to a commercial area. The only exception to this is a small strip of shops next to the property called the Quad. While the Quad isn't bad, it's very limited and only has a handful of shops. <coughs> 
so it's far from fully meeting the needs of the local community. Zoning the former Bailey property to mixed use would help with the lack of commercial properties in that area. For these reasons, I believe that it'd be the best interest in property involved, it'd be in the best interest of all the parties involved for this property to be zoned for mixed use and for the plans to include both residential and commercial aspects. Thank you. All right, thanks Alexander. Carolyn Davis. Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you for listening. Um, I've aired other <laughs> points before, so I'm just going to add a couple today. One was already answered. I had a concern about the parking. Uh, I did not want parking to be extended to curbside on the main road um, because, as Ken Pratt said, with the school issue, children walking, parent cars already parked there waiting for pickup and drop off of kids. If you get residential parking on that road, you're gonna have congestion. You may be down to one or no lane traffic during those parts of the school year, the drop off and pick up time, but it sounded like maybe you've addressed the parking issue adequately. Um, the other one was, um, well, I guess that was it, other than what I've said before. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Kelly. Jan Barber. My name is Jan Barber, and I want to thank mayor, the mayor and the council for uh, setting this up so that we can have some discussion. Uh, I was one of two people who circulated a petition and it was in the 350 page part of your packet just saying that we we had concerns and i had about 40 signatures on mine at this point understanding more of the situation my concern is about the same thing you've already heard the ingress and the egress for are right across from the Colonial Forest back gate. And if there are 140, was it 140 or 130 units with two car garages? I'm, I'm not, uh, I'll, not to clarify, but one of those two, then we're gonna have an awful lot of cars. The road is very narrow. I mean, for when you consider the congestion. And after the pandemic was over, and the grammar school, middle school, and high school kids were once more being picked up by the buses, the school buses, twice a day. There's a lot of congestion already. It's not difficult. I'm glad to see the kids. And when it's raining, they're out there with, with their cars, running their engine to keep the place warm. It's, it's not a nightmare, but it would be more dangerous with another 140 or more cars to coming and going at rush hour. That is my main concern. We have no buses at this point. When I first moved into Colonial Forest, probably 12 years ago, I'm a resident of Federal Way. Uh, I moved here, <laughs> Obama was president. Okay, so a, a ways back, more than 10 years. Um, at that point, there was a bus by Colonial Forest. There was even a little uh, bench right by our gate, and that disappeared. Um, and the, the group of 145 units, assuming that even half of them were filled, would cause a problem. Thank you for listening, and thank you for setting this forum up. All right. Thanks, Jan. Uh, do we have anybody online or any other comments? No, Mayor, I don't have anybody signed up or online. So anybody else? Sir, please. And we'll need you, uh, if you could uh, state your name clearly for the record, and then we'll get you to fill out a, a, a pink sheet when you're done. Mr. Mayor and council members, my name is James H. Kim. I live in Quiet Forest too. And uh, I was the one who collected signatures in opposition to the rezoning. 
And I think we collected about, uh, what is 60 or 40, <laughs> some signatures. And I found out the neighbors, quite 42, quite 43, and colonial forest and also other neighbors, they all, most of them, majority of them opposed to zoning changes. The reason they they worried about uh, tra heavy traffic, congestions, and and also environment, and also you know we, we thought there's uh, you, the developers building the low income multi unit apartments. Uh, now that you have changed the stance, so that's good. But uh, my concern, my concern is with you, council members. Have you ever given opportunity to alternative idea, keeping the current zoning? And I noticed the city zoning regulation is office park here allows many other alternatives. The one that I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really advocating is uh, weekend farming, urban farming, and it's included in the zoning. So have you ever thought, given the opportunity to alternative idea, instead of just one idea, one developer, one development, and uh, given the chance, why, why is it that? Why would we not give a, another opportunity opportunity to other alternative ideas? That's my, <clears throat> my concern. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Okay, um, and sir, if you could please, sir, James, um, <laughs> let's have you fill out a pink sheet to make sure that we've got you as an official um, participant in this process. Is there anybody else who'd like to give public comment? All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so all comments are complete. Council, do you have any questions of staff, the applicant, or any of the citizens who commented? Councilmember Sepadasi. Yes. So I have several questions. Um, I think my first question is to staff. Um, in your presentation, you were talking about market rate, or it could go to anybody actually, talking about um, market rate slash affordable housing came up. And so is it part market rate and a portion maybe is um, affordable or is it all market rate? How are we? Uh, currently, they are proposing a market rate development. Um, once you go over a certain amount of dwelling units within our code, um, there would be a percentage um, as affordable, and there would be a covenant uh, recorded along with the development of the property uh, for those units to remain affordable. Okay, thank you. But I don't think I heard that from the developers, so I wanted to make sure that you, you two are consistent with what I'm hearing, or if I didn't hear it, I apologize. Um, and then my other, um, well, maybe it's a concern is, oh, first of all, I do appreciate what Alex said about mixed use. I think that's a great idea of, of use of that space. Um, in particular, if we don't want so many cars on the road, then I think that would really provide a way for people to, to walk. So making it walkable and making other um, um, services and or uh, businesses to be there would actually cut back, cut down on, on um, cars being used to go places for shopping. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it would it would help that problem. Um, and then talk, you talked about condo slash home ownership, where if the developer thinks it's feasible, then it would be it would be done later. So my concern with that is really, it would be great to have a way into home ownership. So is it possible to see maybe a percentage of those of those units could be condos rather than everything out there to be rental and then um, I know it's it's based on what the owners want to do but I would like to see set aside just so it's guaranteed that we'll have condos also available to, to uh, for a home ownership that's my comment thank you all right would you Any, to respond sure to that? um 
the city council certainly has the ability to modify or include different items. Um, uh, at, at this point, it is uh, at the sole discretion of the developer. Um, I'm not sure if they, if we can invite them back up, if appropriate to comment. Yeah, I would, or, I would like that to be some included somewhere somehow, because okay. that's one thing that we really want to push as home ownership. And for people who can't afford single family housing, this is a way to get people to be homeowners. And so um, you're right. I mean, it's up to the council, but also I'm just encouraging the developers to consider that. Absolutely. Let's, okay. let's, let's I, have the developers answer that. Because yeah. I'd like to follow up on that same question. Um, and can I just say something before we have them yeah. come up? I mean, I'm assuming that the people bought the product knew what it was zoned before they purchased it. And um, so we all know that it was not available to build uh, condos on or townhouses or apartments or anything. And part of uh, when I read through the land use, it talked about having home ownership as a key to changing zoning. Well, that's what I read or what I interpreted. Sure. And what I'm hearing. So I would, I really want to follow up what uh, Lydia said is, what is the home ownership um, plan on this whole project? Um, so I, I, I'm echoing what you're saying. I, I really want to understand that. Um, sure. Uh, we will have Eric Labrie, the applicant, yeah. come up and discuss that further. Those are great questions. One thing that is in the development agreement is a requirement for the entire project to be condominiumized. So each unit can be can be individually owned. This far out from development and occupancy and without even having zoning in place, nobody knows what that market what the market will do between now and then. I mean we when, before we started this, you know home sales were going through the roof. Interest rates were nothing. Things have changed. And we're, 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 we're agreeing in the development agreement to do a condominium on the entire project so that if the market will support it, those units can be sold individually. We can't guarantee it at this point. Does that make sense? <clears throat> but it is that missing middle housing that people can afford as a step between an apartment to a townhome to possibly a single family detached, if that's their choice. Casper, did you have a follow up? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about what I want to ask, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, I guess one question is, when you go into a project or way I think when you go into a project, you either know you're going to sell it or you're going to rent it. I mean, we see that in federal way and the market interest rates change and, and things like that, but you still are building to either sell or to hold. There's not a kind of, well, we don't know what the market's going to be. So I, I have, I understand what you're saying because nobody has a crystal ball, but it really is. Are we going into this project? To, like Colonial Forest, which is right north, that's for sale. The people behind that are for sale. This property is office product, or I mean, not office product, but uh, what it's OP. But you, you got to have some idea. Is it really for sale or is it really for rent? I mean, that's that's my question because we need ownership and more than we need rentals. I understand your concern. I can, I can. It's not a concern. It's more for clarification, okay. because if we're going to make a decision to change this, you really have to understand what the change is. What's the real intention? Not we're going to look at it three years from now or five years from now. I mean, it, it, it usually run the performance and you know what you're thinking about. I would think. Um, I, I can't speak for the developer. I'm speaking for the landowner. I can tell you that Intercorp, builds high quality product. No question. And and 
that I, I, I again I don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you that typically doesn't lend itself to rentals forever. If you're going to rent something, you're going to you're going to build it probably a little less expensively, in my professional opinion. Um, if Liz would like to add anything, she's certainly welcome to. But we're we're telling you at this point, when we began the process, the market and and things have changed dramatically, and and nobody can tell you three years from now when this gets built, if we're going to be seeing 20% interest, if inflation is going to continue the way it's going. So they are proceeding with the agreement that they will condominiumize the unit so they can be sold. If they are rental, they still provide that step towards home ownership because it is a larger unit than a, a typical apartment, because it has a garage, um, because it, it lives like a house. It's a family house, not just a, an apartment. And I, and I hope that helps. I appreciate your attempt at uh, saying we don't have a, <laughs> we don't, we don't have Mr. A, Mr. We don't have a crystal ball. Mr. LeBray. Right. Council President Kutchmer. Sure, I just, um, can you address the traffic Certainly. issue? Um, this is a non-project rezone. We have shown you a conceptual site plan to go along with the development agreement so, it, so, so you can kind of see what we're thinking. When a true application for development happens, when this is approved or if this is approved, there is another land use process at which point the site plan will be developed. The locations of the access points will be tied into a traffic study and that will all be analyzed. This is a non-project rezone. <clears throat> Um, Kasper Walsh and then Kasper Adobe. Yeah, basically, I, I had the same question on on the on the traffic, uh, and maybe if we can show the maps again to kind of see what the possibilities are as far as the ingress and egress for the for the the unit. The possibilities are on three twenty eighth or first, and and by city traffic policy, and EJ can correct me if I'm wrong. The project is supposed to take access off the lesser classification roadway. So that leaves 328. The exact alignment, I can't tell you. Okay. We haven't gotten to that level of design yet. Just like we haven't gotten to the level of design to figure out the size of the stormwater or or you know the size of the sewer. Okay. okay. And and then a question, I guess this one would be for, for Natalie. Uh, Natalie, you had mentioned that after a certain size apartment, there's a certain percentage that needs to be low income instead of market rate. What size is that, and then what is the percentage? I mean, if it did stay, stay uh, rentals instead of instead of condos, um, it, it wouldn't uh, pertain to the size of the actual unit as far as bedrooms. It's just but the number of units, but right? The number of units on site uh, for multifamily to uh, be required to provide um, affordable housing provisions. And, and then along with that, what would the definition of affordable be? Uh, it's linked to with um, average if with the AMI. Is like 80% AMI less than 80% or, or less than 50%? I mean, that's significant. Um, one moment. New projects involving 25 dwelling units or more are required to provide affordable housing units as part of the project, at least two dwelling units or 5% of the total number of proposed units, whichever is greater. Um, okay. And, and, and what, and what percent am I to say? I, I don't, I'm not saying that, but what's the definition of affordable? Uh, that would be under paragraph two, 80%. offered for sale at a rate that is affordable to those individuals having incomes that are 80% or below uh, median, oh. median county income. Which so it's 50% or below. 80. That's what it says. Oh, 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 up there. Okay. Rental affordable okay. Uh, dwelling units that are offered for rent at a rate at affordable families of incomes that are 50% or below uh, medium county income. 
which we will be but proposing a code amendment to change that to AMI shortly this year. Okay, it's confusing. We hear one place it says 80%, one place it says 50%. What is the difference? Uh, owner occupied affordable housing is the 80%, um, and then rental affordable housing um, is that second portion of the paragraph. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Adobe, and then yeah. Deputy Mayor Honda, and then and then Councilmember Sepidos. I just have a clarifying question. Of all the properties, uh, the developer is built in the area. We saw Issaquah and Seattle. How many are, were for sale and how many were are still under rent? What's the track record? I'm sorry, could you please come to the, Ms. Saldano? Could you? Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't have the number off the I mean, top I mean, of my if head, you but we, we build we build a range of housing types from townhome communities between four units um, on a single development up to 100, 150 units. Mm -hmm. And we also build um, uh, urban infill apartment homes, which are anywhere from 100 units to 400 unit projects. But, but, but my question is not that I, I'm clearly understand that you have the capabilities to Thou do this. Thousands of units. Okay, but what percent, if you were to look at the portfolio, is 50% for sale and the others, are you hold or, I mean, what? In terms of number of units, yeah, it would be I mean, much what's... higher on the rental because the projects are longer. <laughs> okay, so mostly, would I would be right in assuming most of your projects are buy and hold instead of sell to an individual party? Is that what you're what you're saying? I'm just, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm Most of our townhome projects in, in the markets that we've worked in are sold as condominiums, to the, our townhome projects. Okay, to the person that- To individual purchasers. Okay. okay. And our, of course, you know, then there's rental portfolio. Yeah, I understand. So this project, as you look at it going into it is, again, market, interest rates, all those things are different, but your main goal is to potentially sell them to individuals for owner, home ownership. It, it's too soon to say this project doesn't deliver until 2025. Yes. And But what I can tell you is that we're committed to building a high quality. And, and I understand property. that. I looked at what you've seen. I can tell that. Um, maybe I could ask a question. Well, can I ask a question to Keith? Of course. Yeah. Will, will this project, if we pass our resolution tonight, will this project benefit from that potentially? Uh, good evening, Keith Niven, planning manager. Um, uh, so the the item that council member Doby is referring to is a school impact fee, which is under regular business, I think maybe item C. I didn't memorize the agenda, yes. but I think it's down there. Uh, it depends. <laughs> Sorry for that a gray answer. Uh, the, the point that uh, Mr. Morrison made on behalf of Merlon Geyer earlier is that his concern is that reducing the school impact fees, which the council intends to do this evening, is a potentially temporary outcome, and it could potentially pendulum back. And as you heard from uh, Ms. Soldano from Intercorp, um, by the time when you pay building, when you pay uh, school impact fees, it's when you pull your building permit. Okay. And they're probably a couple years down the road from yeah. doing that. So I understand it that, likely, but, likely they will benefit from it. But, but, if, but there's some variability that we don't control. But if this council or the future council does not keep impact fees zero, then they would benefit on 145 units times whatever the number is, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. I have a few questions. Uh, one, I don't understand um, the attorney. I, I'm sorry, I forgot your name already. Uh, when you talk about it's going to be um, condominium, condo, condo, I don't know what you, what you said, but it's being built to be condos, could likely be sold as or rented out as apartment units until such a time that it could be sold as condos? Is that what you, you're trying to tell us? 
Is that the plan? We understood from the planning commission that the path to home ownership was important. Right. So we agreed in the development agreement that I believe it says before issuance of occupancy or a building permit or at some point after we're down the road quite a bit, a condominium map will be recorded on the property to segregate each individual townhome so that they can be sold individually. Does that answer your question? So at the time of occupancy, they will be sold as condos? Not necessarily. We're not guaranteeing that they will be sold. They, the, everything is in place. If the market is good, they can be sold. There's nothing hindering the developer other than market forces from selling that unit. It's not like they have to then go go through the whole platting process or then try to go through a condominium process when you have occupied units. It's we're setting it up so that it can be sold in the future. And has the developer done this in other areas where they've gone down, that they've used this plan where they initially were rentals and then became condos? We have not. She said we have not. Yeah, I heard that. Although they have sold many townhome communities through condominium, condom, condominiumization. I can't say that word. <laughs> my, my concern is listening to you, trying to explain this to us, is um, talking with other developers who say that um, it would be very difficult to build condos in federal way because of the cost, that we would have a rental, um, they would be rental units for a long, long time before they, they could potentially become sold to you know, a family so I, I'm concerned with that. I'm also concerned with um, the traffic. If you go down 328, there's, it's a really pretty street. If you haven't driven down that street, it's really pretty. Mm -hmm. It almost it looks like it doesn't belong in the city of Federal Way. It's just, it looks like it belongs in a peaceful little town without you know, a lot of people. Uh, but I am concerned that it isn't ready to have a lot of, lot more vehicles on it. And if you look at the Quad Shopping Center, there are no entrances on First Avenue until you get to the light, which is 328. So I would be concerned of having an entrance to, to this uh, development on First Avenue. I think it would inhibit traffic on First Avenue and cause some issues with, um, with that. And I would be concerned with uh, the increased traffic on 328. So I, I hope that there would not be any street parking allowed, especially on that corner. That would be uh, difficult for people to enter 328 and exit 328 with the light. So, all right, that's all for now. Thank all right, you. thank you. I, Brian? Um, thanks, Mayor. If I could just address the, a couple of comments about traffic and I just wanna, um, uh, Reemphasize that this is a question of zoning and use of the property, and not necessarily the, the the site design of the property. If you recall, with some of the warehouser discussions that we had, there were concerns about the the both the traffic that IRG was going to cause, and then also the use, the question of warehouses, and the question of warehouses was answered years ago when the zoning was in place. That's the discussion that you're having right now is zoning. The question of traffic will happen later. So if you approve this, they will come back with a development application that says we want to build this many units, and then they will say, here's how we're going to accommodate the traffic on the property now that it's zoned for this use. So the, the, the traffic comments are, are, are warranted, um, but that will be accounted for in a later discussion and is not criteria for the zone change. Right, Just want to be clear you. on that. Okay, uh, Council Member Sefadas. Thank you. And kind of partially as answered my question, so I appreciate it. But back to the condo apartment um, situation, is the unit, is the um, development also gonna have 
ADA accessible SAPA units, or is it all just townhouse, which is which have stairs? So there's none um, planned for people who are disabled. Uh, Ms. Soldano, can you please approach the podium? I apologize. We haven't designed the project yet. Could you please uh, so hand, that to her, hand that to her? It'll be designed per code. The city clerk. But but wouldn't you be required? Isn't there a requirement that there be ADA compliance? So, Mayor, th these are homes. So it's like a single family home. It's basically the same requirements as a single family home versus an apartment, which has other requirements. So it would be designed to a home standard. But what we're hearing is that they're going to be. Uh, and maybe I can clarify a little bit about the condominization that seems to be confusing people. That's a legal structure. Right to allow them to be sold later on. It creates an association. So they're each individual, they're not parcels, but they're listed with the county recorder and they can be sold separately. Right. But if they're not, and they are apartments, then they would be, wouldn't they be required to be they would ADA be, compliant? Just like you rent a single family home, you'd be renting a, a unit. Um, so ADA does not apply? No. I see, okay. Wow. Yeah, all right, okay. Okay, um, so. Uh, I, I have one more question. Can I have one more? Of course. Yeah. I, I, I figure we're going to, the traffic will all get figured out. That's not any an issue to me. That's part of what we do in here. The question that I, that I, in my mind has to do with, we're talking about that middle piece of housing and everybody's got an opinion. What is middle housing? And to me, middle housing in federal way is a path to affordable ownership, but a developer can make a profit. I mean, we're not here to, they're in the business of building affordable housing. We're in the business of making a great city for our citizens. If you have a development agreement, can there can it be brought up in such a way that X amount of years down the line is date certain the target to convert a condiment uh, to condominium to home ownership or is that a question that I can't so, ask? I think it's important to keep in mind as we're discussing this, that this was a negotiation with the developer. So yes, we can negotiate all kinds of conditions, whether or not that's marketable, marketable or feasible for them. It's going to be a two-sided discussion. So I don't think that's something we can decide tonight in this room. It would be a negotiation. You could express those interests and we would go back to the developer and see if that's something that we can work out. But um, but I think we're hearing pretty clearly that they're, they've they've gone about as far as, as they're willing to go by agreeing to this kind of the potential in the future to sell them as condominiums. And I think pretty clearly that's the intent, but they're not going to commit to it. So we can go back and have that discussion if council so desires. So, so, so can I clarify then what you just said, the real, depending what our decision is tonight, or if we move it to the next meeting and I continue this hearing, really is what we're hearing today is what we're gonna be deciding on. We can't decide on something in the future because even though it's in the, in the agreement or development agreement, there is no time certain. So it's basically not something you can bank on 10 years from now or 15, it's a, a good faith effort to say, yes, this is what we want to do. But if market goes to 20%, nobody wants to sell it. There's no mechanism to force it. Is that correct? Maybe I, I'm, I'm maybe someone that's actually more familiar with the development agreement than me should answer that. But my understanding is that it's, that is the, the constraint is just that, that they agree to the condominium structure and that they'll see. It's in place, but it's not enforceable. Right. Okay. Okay. So I've got uh, the deputy mayor, Councilmember Walsh, and then the council president. So tonight, if we vote on it, and I actually like the idea of continuing this till the next council meeting. And mayor, can I clarify one thing? The action tonight is to close the hearing or continue the hearing. So okay. there's an ordinance that would be brought to council at a future council meeting if um, they want to pass this, but the ordinance... What's that? Is only this is just the hearing. Okay. So the ordinance is not on for a vote tonight. Okay, good. 
Um, so my question is, since what we're voting on is changing the zoning to um, allow multifamily to be built there, correct? If we change the zoning, we can't necessarily deny uh, if, if, let's say, DEVCO wants to come in, they could come in and build there. Is that correct? As long as it's changed to the the development zone? agreement that is currently before you would be in force, so they'd be subject to that as well, which does specify that it's market rate. Okay. All right. Other than the 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 small percentage that's required by the city to be affordable. All right. Thank you. That's where we're all. Okay. So so tonight, what we're discussing is both the zoning change and the development agreement. Okay. Uh, and so. Um, I mean, personally, I think that the, the, the zoning change is, is fine, provided that the development agreement is satisfactory to, to everyone. And that's my, my one concern is, you know, I mean, can we put into the development agreement, I mean, it wouldn't be done tonight, but can we put into the development agreement something to the effect that, that within five years that 25% of the units, what five years of of of, it, of completion, that twenty five percent would be uh, sold or something like that. Is that something that could potentially be put into a development agreement? Could I address that, um, Keith Niven again, planning manager? So, to, I think where um, the city attorney and Mr. Davis were earlier is, what's the hook, right? So. They build this project and the clock strikes midnight and we say, okay, now you have to sell 25% of them. What if they say no? What, what does the city do? Do we close them down? Do we evict people from their units? So, so you, if you play that out, it's um, even if they were to agree to it, what's the enforcement action the city would have? five years from now or 10 years from now that they're in default of a development agreement, which changed the zoning in the first place. So I think it's a hard construct to think yeah. through. Um, and so we always look at it. What can the city do if we're actually going to try and enforce something that we wanted as part of a development agreement? So yeah, hope probably, that probably make, make it bonded some way, but that probably wouldn't be agreeable to them anyway. So, and, just to follow up on that, that was part of my concern, but also the other part is, like I said, this is a negotiation with them. And so the developer has stated what they're willing to do. So if we want to renegotiate, that's what it would be. It would be us going back to the table. All right, Council President. Well, uh, am I correct in assuming that since this is, development is being set up as a condominiumized development, that even if they do start out with renting, that eventually those will be sold when the market allows for it. That would appear to me to be the benefit of the way this is being set up. Could be. It would be able to be. Be able to be, right, which which would be a, very beneficial. Okay. Uh, Can I ask one the, more question, uh, Mayor? Yeah, please. Excuse me. I'm sorry for asking these questions, but I, I really need to think it through. If if the zoning gets changed and the developer decides we're not going to do this, did we just create a flip and they make a whole bunch of money, whoever owns the property? So it's it's tied to the development agreement that you're proposing. Okay. So, that's, so this, that's a, it's so a conditional if, zone change is another way of looking at it. So on the one could, hand, you got a traditional zone change which has no conditions and another one that has a lot. This is basically has really narrowing it down to one and we're going to say that you have to be market rate and you have to provide a home ownership opportunity so if the developer for the the business world changes interest rates go way up they don't want to do it whoever they sell this property to would be obligated to follow the development agreement that's correct so that's our that's the kind of the safeguard to making this change it just doesn't make the property more valuable without performing on the development agreement. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, the chair would be amenable to a, a motion to continue the public hearing to the next city council meeting. Yeah, I'd um, like to move to continue the public hearing on the 2021 comprehensive plan amendment development agreement 
for the former Bally's property to September 6, 2022 council meeting. Second. Sure, second. There's been a motion, a second. Is there any uh, further discussion? Council Tran? Oh, are you just getting ready to vote, or did you have something to say? I do have. Uh, okay, go ahead. Councilmember Tran. I would like to make a, a family <coughs> amendment to the motion by changing the date to September 20th instead. All right. There's a. Uh, would you consider that a friendly amendment or not? Uh, or should we vote on that? It's, that's two meetings away. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Or, of course. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to make this decision, I think we need to make it sooner than later for the the developer and everybody involved. And I think we're moving it ahead just so we can think about it. And, you know, nobody makes a decision like that first time. But I don't know what benefit does it go for two more. I mean, I'm open to it, but I'm wondering why. Oh, can ahead. I respond to that? Yeah, let's let's get to this. Uh, uh, the only reason just, is yeah. because I'm not going to be here on the oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would have a reason that we could should think about. We need to at some point really discuss ARPA and this this hearing could you know take a, a while at the next meeting. So perhaps it would be best to not put two large things that we have a lot of discussion in one meeting. Would you consider that a friendly amendment? I'm okay with that based okay. on that reason because I want him here to be part of the decision. As yeah. do I. As and do I, and I will not be here the sixth either, but I plan on joining by Zoom, I, I hope. All right. Good to know, Council Member. Thank you very much. Well, I'll be here. All right. There's been a motion and a second and a and a friendly amendment to uh, to uh, uh, essentially move this to the second meeting in September, which is the 20th. Uh, there's been a discussion. Is there any more discussion or further discussion? All those in favor of that uh, motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, we'll be back on this on the 20th. Thank you, everybody, for your comments and the public presentations. Uh, great job, uh, Natalie. Uh, great job. Appreciate it. Uh, all right. Now, moving on to the next item. Um, okay. Uh, Council business, the 2024 collective bargaining agreement with the Federal Way Support Services Association, a brief staff report from Vanessa Audet, our human services manager. Resources. Yes. What, what did I say? Oh, human resources. What did you say? I don't know. Human did I say services? <laughs> Vanessa, what did I say? Human services. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's wow. Neat. Hmm? You just printed out the I know for us. Yeah, I Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, tonight I'm here with you, I'm here before you with the policy question, should the council authorize the mayor to execute the proposed collective bargaining agreement with the Police Support Services Association? For a little background, our current agreement expired December 31st of 2021. Since then, we've been bargaining to negotiate the proposed three-year contract before you tonight. The contract before you tonight conforms with previously provided council direction and council authority, and the members of the PSSA voted to ratify 12 to 8 in favor of the contract. Essentially, this is a three-year contract. In 2022, we'll implement a market salary survey to bring the group's uh, wages up to market value. The total increase for 2022, which includes the Me Too 3.5% COLA that non-reps receive, is $173,516. In 2023, effectively, they'll receive another 2% COLA increase with a Me Too for non-reps. If non-reps receive more than 2%, the PSSA will receive the same. That total increase is 159042 And in 2024, a 2% COLA again, January 1st, with the Me Too clause for non-reps, with a total increase of 145200 425,000. Sorry, it's been a long day. <clears throat> a summary of additional changes includes some things that have no budget impact, such as the addition of the Juneteenth holiday and an additional vacation accrual for members with 30 plus years of service. Uh, there is a new flat rate bilingual pay premium of $200 per month for any members who test and qualify for the bilingual pay premium. There's an increase in trainer pay that was minimal from 3% to 5% for hours spent training new, new hires in the unit. 
and a small increase to the annual boot allowance from $100 to $200 that impacts five members. And then we documented our ancillary insurance changes, which were put into place January 1st this year for all city employees, as well as documenting new grievance procedures. The mayor's recommendation is to approve the collective bargaining agreement with the PSSA, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Council, any questions? All right, Council President Coach Moore, do you have a motion? Thank you very much, Mark. Good job, Vanessa. Uh, I move approval of the proposed 2022-2024 collective bargaining agreement with the Federal Support Services Association and authorize the mayor to execute said agreement. Second. It's been a motion. A second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, Vanessa. You. Okay. Great work. All right. Approval of interim city administrator appointment. Uh, I'll do uh, this very briefly. Uh, Brian Davis, as you know, has been serving in the interim capacity since uh, uh, February 8th. I have gone the past eight years uh, without a uh, city administrator um, uh, position while we did have a chief of staff for the first two and a half years um, in Brian Davis. Excuse me, uh, Brian Wilson. Uh, Brian's done a great job. Um, appointments can only be for a period of six months. Uh, we are still uh, in a period of... Uh, I'm, I'm trying uh, the position out. He's done an exemplary uh, job um, uh, working with all kinds of administrative tasks and uh, uh, his uh, uh, qualifications um, are, are well, well met. So I'm ready to answer any questions, but I'd, uh, uh, anybody have any questions about this? I, Deputy Mayor Hunter. Thank you. Um, I certainly agree that Brian is doing a great job and I'm very glad to have someone in this position. I, I think that's awesome. My question is, um, he is continuing his job as community development director mm -hmm. at the same time. And is he being compensated for doing two jobs at the same time? And if not, is there a reason why? I think there is, uh, there's crossover certainly, but I think that we did uh, compensate. Um, did Vanessa leave? Um, yeah, he's, so yeah. yes, he's getting what we call out of class pay. So anytime, say your supervisor, <laughs> Uh, is on vacation and uh, someone of a lower rank fills that position, the city routinely gives 10% yeah. as the increased salary. And we did that right away as soon right. as we uh, put him in that position. And the um, community development department is running all right with, uh, with. From my perspective, Brian, would you like to speak to that? It's running great. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's right. Exactly. There, I mean, there's, I mean, we're dealing with challenges. I would say that the challenges that we're dealing with are not anything different than as a result of me being in this position. Okay. But yes, we're, we're, we're getting staff stolen by other departments. And so we have to, you know, deal with that. And uh, it, it's good to see them getting promoted, but it does create some holes that we have to deal with in the meantime. And my last question is, do all staff report to Brian, including the department directors? Well, I think we, I still have, he does certain reports with them, but I, I retain a, a direct report to all the uh, employees. Okay. And, yeah. Thank you. And I, yeah, exactly. Thanks. I guess remember stuff at Austin. Yeah. Um, it's a concern that I have, and I appreciate Brian, what you do. And I like you in your position, but as we're talking budget, I'm concerned that if we think we can get away with having one person to do two positions, I'm concerned that when that time comes, um, how do we justify oh. having that position? I, I need a question that. and a concern that I'm asking, but I, otherwise I do appreciate what he's doing, but this can't continue. But at the same time, you're showing me that it's happened. You know, he's been in this role for six months now and we're continuing it. So I feel like when there comes a, budget crunch, we as council could decide that we don't need that position or one person could do the job of two directors. So that's just something we need to really consider. Well, and I, I think, forward. Well, let me say that I think that that actually brings up something that I, you know, I, I did this job for uh, eight years without having, uh, a, you know, I did all the direct reports with me. I, I really felt strongly uh, having led the effort to create the elected mayor system that I wanted to have the directors report directly to me on a regular basis. And I still have daily, uh, multiple daily contacts with all the directors. I, I do think that uh, this is something I'm trying out on an interim basis to see how it feels and whether there's a value added. But I agree with you wholeheartedly 
that at the conclusion of or we'd have to we'll have to make a decision when this is up um, whether this is going to be uh, whether uh, Brian becomes the permanent um, administrator or whether uh, we you know essentially this is an, an interim kind of a trial uh, basis. Uh, there is a, a little project I'm working on in which uh, you know I may not be the person to make that ultimate decision, and I didn't. I want to make sure that I. Uh, I'm talking obliquely here uh, uh, out of necessity, uh, but somebody else would likely need to make a, a more permanent decision. But it is critical that we have institutional um, uh, memory and uh, make sure that we, if there is a transition at the end of this year to start the next year, if that transition in my position occurs, that we have somebody where in which it would be seamless. That's one issue. The second issue, though, is is I I do think that I anticipate say that I'm here on January 1st and January 2nd and beyond. Um, I think that we would ne need to make that permanent in a separate position, separate from community development, and I think that we should plan accordingly. So I I appreciate that is an excellent question. I think actually the deputy mayor was trying to kind of get at that as well, but I you can't do both in the long term. Right, and I totally appreciate. I think that position is important and necessary to have. Yeah. So, like I said, I do like that, and I have no problem. Maybe having an interim um, community development director yeah. might be a good way to go, because if this becomes permanent, then how are we elevating and promoting someone internally? Um, so maybe considering that as an, as an option yeah. at this critical point, because... If we vote on um, Brian continuing this role, then maybe it's good to have an interim director for the um, community development. Otherwise, no questions will come. Again, with, with budget crunch, if and when that happens, I don't know. I mean, we all may not be here, but it could be a question that could come up where the council could decide, oh, this we've done it before, we can do it again. One of the things I did not want to do, and I just be to be candid with you, um, if I'm not here next year, and I, who knows what's going to happen? I, I don't know, and I can't talk about it. But uh, other than to say, if it's not me, I did not want to impose a permanent position on uh, a future occupant, um, and I and I didn't think that would be appropriate. So what we're asking right now, what I'm asking is uh, uh, an additional six months, um, and then, well, obviously, I think we'll need to have this discussion during budget discussions. Um, and make sure that we're planning for the future, which I think next year, uh, whether I go or stay, um, I think we're going to need to have not only a CD director, but a permanent um, uh, administrator. Okay, are we good? Okay, uh, Council President uh, Coach Moore, do you have a motion? Thank you very much. Uh, excellent suggestion, uh, Mayor Farrell and Council Member Seppa Dawson and Council Member Hanna. Uh, I move, and uh, thank you, Brian, for doing a wonderful job. I move approval of Mayor Farrell's appointment of Brian Davis as interim city administrator. Second. There's been a motion, a second, a good discussion. Any other questions or discussions? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Congratulations, Brian. We didn't have to count votes. All right. <laughs> He's doing both jobs. He's doing both jobs. Okay. All right. You're doing a great job. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Now, moving on to uh, resolution school impact fees. Keith Niven. <laughs> Planning manager. I'm confident of that. Gets a little chippy at 9.30, doesn't yeah, it? <laughs> exactly. We haven't even started. Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's written down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try and save Thomas one run out this evening. He's so He's on his way. No, he's, no. I'm he's almost, on deck. I've got this. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a couple of bats in his hand. He's on deck. <laughs> He's calling his friend. What? I, I, oh. oh, this is the advanced course. I don't think I've had this before. I, I, uh, that way. That's way <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council President Coach Mar, Deputy Mayor Honda, and City Council members Keith Niven, Planning Manager, back again. Um, all right. So, background uh, Land Use and Committee Chair um, Dovey asked to have a conversation about school impact fees. And so, uh, beginning in July and continuing into August, we had a conversation at two committee meetings about school impact fees. 
Um, in between those two conversations, uh, the city received the 2023 capital facilities plan from the school district on July 19th. The 2023 capital facilities plan uh, is calling for a significant change to school impact fees. So the policy question before the city council is, should the city council amend the school impact fees to be in alignment with the 2023 school district capital facility plan? So to give you a little bit of detail, um, right now uh, in Federal Way, our school impact fees for a single family home are $1,845. And for a multifamily apartment, it ranges anywhere between $5,600 to $15,000, depending on uh, the bedrooms and whether it is located within our planned action area, which is the funky map on the right or outside of that area. In looking at our neighbors uh, in King County, um, you can see uh, what school impact fees are being charged by different school districts. Um, you can see that there are some zeros on that scoreboard, um, but there are also some pretty big ones like $20,000 for Issaquah, um, $8,900 for uh, multifamily for Auburn. Um, if you look at the average, the average is $69,37 for single family and $3,043 for multifamily. And the median is Kent at single family for $4,800 and uh, Enumclaw at 2123 for multifamily. And uh, what we received from the school district was a request to take all the school impact fees in federal way down to zero. Okay, so what's before us this evening is a request to amend our uh, fee schedule uh, to basically take all of the school impact fees to zero. Um, and the options are amend the school impact fees. Uh, number two is amend the school impact fees following an evaluation of the findings prepared by the consultant currently working on reviewing this. So we, <laughs> we had gotten a, a grant from Department of Commerce to help us explore the different barriers that we thought we had in terms of keeping housing production from actually uh, being on par with our neighbors. Uh, school impact fees, multifamily tax exemption, inclusionary zoning, uh, density bonus program. We have hired a consultant. They're currently in the middle of a study, um, but this came up uh, in the middle and seemed like it was the right thing to do. Uh, the third thing is if you don't think we should uh, amend the fees, uh, please provide additional uh, direction to staff. Uh, the mayor's recommendation is option number one, which is amend the school impact fees. Uh, All right. Are there any questions? Uh, Councilmember Doby. I just want to clarify, that's effective today, not 2023. That would be effective today. Okay. And that was and a question that was asked of the school district multiple times, uh, and they yeah. said that was fine. Yeah, so if we vote yes, then the school impact fees, as we know it, will end after the mayor signs the resolution. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilor, any other questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor Honda? No, oh, thank you. So um, this could potentially increase the uh, construction of multifamily around the city? That would be my expectation, yes. And the school district says that um, they're fine with that, that they can house the students and they're okay with it. Um, from looking at their uh, capital facilities plan um, and listening to the presentation they made at Land Use and Transportation Committee, the reason why they are um, recommending going to zero is they have been charting a reduction in students uh, within the district, and they think that trend will continue, which means that with growth and additional housing units coming in, there is capacity in the existing schools to house those students. And th so therefore uh, charging the impact fees, they, there's nothing to build to accommodate that extra growth. So, so I think the answer is that downward trend in students um, is what is causing this to go to zero for now. Hmm. Interesting, um, well, I, I'm glad that we're doing this now instead of when we normally do it at the end of the year. So yeah. and thank you. 
If I could make one other comment. Yes. This is, you know, we, from a land use standpoint, as it came through committee, this was and started, we're going to be doing a lot of development downtown. We have the Sound Transit property. We have the Target property. We have all these things happening. I mean, we just had an example of somebody came to us to want to rezone to build product in our city. This will, in my opinion, stimulate growth, the kind of growth that we've been looking for. And we, it won't be a, a hindrance or a stumbling block to people who want to invest in federal way. Okay. Any other uh, any other comments? Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilor Bordeaux, do you have a motion? Yeah. Um, I move approval of the proposed resolution. Right. Is, there, is there been a motion and a second? Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The matter approves, is approved unanimously. Item D, resolution, City of Federal Way Interfund Loan, Steve Groom, Finance Director. As you all probably know, we have a $5 million balloon payment facing me in November. And if I do this, now I thought when I wrote the agenda item and my memo and the amortization tables for the FedRAC committee, I thought that would be perfectly self-explanatory. And then we came to FedRAC. I'm here to do a better job explaining because I need to not only convince you that uh, we've looked at all the options and that the re uh, recommendation I'm making uh, is the best for us, but I also need to give you the ammunition to explain it to others. And so what I have, let's see. Uh, the question facing me, uh, because this is a finance question, I'm not going to look at planning. I'm not going to look at the, you know, the many th aspects to the project, the underlying project. But the best financing option that I see can buy us time. And the reason time helps is that extends options. And the options that you all are looking for are, are for planning the highest and best use of the property. It's adjacent to the Performing Arts Center, Sound Transit, Town Center, all that. Uh, there has been some delay due to an easement, and I think, I mean, I stand on the shoulders of previous finance directors, and they never imagined that, that we would be dealing with the balloon payments, but they trusted us to figure it out, and it's, and, and, and I do think it's fairly self-explanatory. If I run through the chronology back in 2013, we bought the property for $8.2 million. We reduced the debt uh, with the sale of a piece of that, and the current lender, uh, there was uh, no need for payments for a couple of years. And then we started making payments uh, in uh, 2019, 2021 with the uh, balloon payment uh, that's due this uh, this year. Now I'm bringing it to us uh, here with plenty of time. There's, there's, there's no real urgency. I'm just trying to plan ahead. I'm talking to the lenders. Uh, the current lender will, and, and other lenders would uh, off, offer us uh, uh, financing. Uh, the balances of the entire city's debt, because one of the questions that I have, I've heard repeatedly, and it's a really good question, why don't we just pay down our debt? Well, let's look at our, our total debt for the whole entire city is $29 million. We're looking at just this one piece, which has the balloon payment, but uh, and, and, and all of our debt service is paid through our real estate excise tax fund. This is the balances of the debt. Uh, I had previously brought a slide, uh, and then here's the question that I want to answer on the next slide. Why don't we pay down the debt with cash on hand? And the cash on hand, I had brought a previous slide. Um, our cash on hand, if I can just walk you through very simply, I have a list of all the different funds in the city, and this column here has got all the fund balances. Down here at the bottom... The total cash of the city is 106 million. And so the obvious question is, well, if we've got that much cash, why can't we pay down all of our debt? And the answer is, well, in the general fund, that's the one that's got no restrictions. $29 million fund balance. Out of that, there's only 1.6 million that's unrestricted. And you say, really? The rest is spoken for. And if you look across that row, you'll say, oh yeah, that's right. We've gotten a large balance of ARPA. And we expect to spend that over a fairly short term, you know, next couple of years. And the city has got the, we have got a reserve requirement. Now, Council Member Norton asked a great question uh, back at FedRAC. And I said, well, 
I didn't think there were any particular restrictions on the on, on all the different funds. Well, there are. Uh, uh, so every fund is a, is restricted for a purpose. In addition, some of the funds have got some reserve requirements. But the the real estate excise fund in particular, that's the one that all of the underlying projects are eligible to be paid with real estate excise tax. So that really has only got two point two million dollars uh, that. Uh, that can be worked with. Now, uh, the f there are three funds that the uh, uh, that this that this agenda item contemplates. We can borrow from some funds that have got some sizable balances. We can't spend it, but we can borrow it, just like we can invest it. We can invest it and get some interest. We can borrow it as long as we give it back within three years because it's restricted money. We can't change the underlying restriction. But this is what allows me to buy us some time. Uh, now, REIT, just so you know, uh, it's got an annual budget, but it funds a ton of work that we all care about. The streets that we all care about, that's the overlay commitment every year. There's a whole multi-year list of CIP projects, both streets and parks. And then, then down there at the bottom, we've, we, we've got the annual debt service, which I think you and I agree we would love to diminish if we could. Um, so the options are we could get a 10-year bank loan, uh, but the problem with that, and, and what would that cost us? That would, that, that, that would cost this fund 600000 per year. We could do a three-year bank loan. That would be really prohibitive. But we could also do, and this is, this is my proposed solution, we could uh, do an interfund loan, not paying interest to a bank. We would pay interest essentially to ourselves, to the three funds that have some extra, uh, that not extra, it's all spoken for. But we could pay ourselves some interest only internal to the city. If at the end of three years, we still end up having to do a bank loan where uh, I think Council Member Walsh, you put it best at, at FEDRAC, we're no worse off in three years. Um, the options uh, on services, if we were to, I mean, if we were to contemplate paying in full, that would take up the entire amount of our overlay and half of the CIP projects, so that's clearly uh, uh, not viable. If we were to refinance with the intent to pay down, uh, uh, that that would take up half of our CIP, and refinancing internally, we can do without any project impact. So that's, that's why the solution that I'm proposing helps on the service side. For the cash management, if we were to want to pay in full, we have insufficient liquidity. As I walk through all the funds, they're all restricted. They just don't have any liquidity. Uh, refinancing with intent to pay down, I don't think it, see, I wasn't here, but I don't think it was ever the city's intent to uh, own the property. It was our intent to uh, provide leadership. So with ultimate uh, redevelopment. So buying an, an extra three years, I think is what we're looking for. And so by it, refinancing internally, that would extend us time to develop the options. So with that, uh, the uh, the resolution is in your packet. It, uh, I, I'm, I'm recommending that, that uh, we authorize the interfund loan that'll refinance the current year's balloon payment over three years. And I hope that I've demonstrated that we've looked at a whole array of, of, of options and that one would be the best one for the city. And with that, we'll take questions. Councilmember Doug, I just have one question. I think this is a great option, but we're Councilmember Tron talked about the interest we're making on the, you know, the money that we're not putting in the state and using the interest, and we're making it. If in budget we decide to take some of that interest and pay down the notes, or the, those aren't committed to anything yet, that interest we're making, is it? Well, I think actually, I think this past year we made, you made last like time a I saw it. You two or a million three? Or yeah, something. actually, well, last time I saw, Steve, we had 700000 but actually it's it's now over a million dollars a year. It's over a million dollars. We're going to need most of that for the budget because we've, you know, we're yeah. having to deal with increased had costs. To, had to ask. <laughs> I want you to look forward to the budget process, and it's going to be complicated, but I will walk us all through it, I promise you. Very good. All right. Um, all right, so. I have a question. Oh, there you are. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. It must be hard for you to see. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Um, so I'll go ahead and support this because the balloon payment just isn't going to work. I'm, you know, but I want this to be the last time we do this. We either sell the property or we refinance it for long term, but this has to be the last time we do this. 
I agree. I agree. I, you know, we were, and just so folks listening at home or watching at home and for the council, obviously we, we worked really hard. I, there, I want to let you guys know week after week after week, I hounded legal counsel, uh, Ryan during management teams and in our one-on-ones, what are we hearing from the owner with regard to the people that own the property immediately to the North about uh, extinguishing that, um, uh, that easement. And that was really something that was just incredibly frustrating. So thank you for your leadership council and, and, uh, uh your willingness to be able to threaten to, uh, and I think we actually did file, uh, the condemnation on that easement because really as a public entity, there was no way we were in a position to have to pay an exorbitant price to extinguish uh, an easement. Um, and now that's been resolved. And now I think, you know, we, we've obviously got the process going on TC3. I think uh, I think you're absolutely spot on. I think we need to make a decision on this strategically. It's good to have options, especially right in our downtown core. But I think time is quickly, uh, rapidly approaching in which to do that. All right. Uh, that being said, um, one sec. Uh, Council Member Tran, do you have a motion? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the proposed resolution. Is there a second? second. It's been a motion and a second. Did I hear a second? Yes. All right. It's been a motion and a second. Is uh, there any further discussion? Yes, Although I'd like to ask. No, I'm yeah. just joking. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. It's unanimous. All right. Now, we have, I, we, I know. Five minutes. So can we do our reports in five minutes? Councilmember Member Dawson? Well, he could start. It's the middle of the... Oh. Go ahead, Councilmember. Member. Okay, Council Member Dovey. No report. Council Member Walsh? No report. Council Member Tran? No report. Council Member Norton? Dang, well, I do have a report. Go. Sorry, you guys. Go. You go. It's good. We got four um, minutes. I just wanted to say um, this weekend, my husband and I were witness to some a really crazy event that had to do with the homeless encampment outside of Wild Waves. And... I think we need a town meeting. We need a town hall meeting where our citizens can come and discuss these issues and get some stuff off their chests. Um, we need to listen to the people of the city. Um, after witnessing what I went through, um, I was completely helpless. And uh, this woman was being attacked. And um, there's nothing we could do about it. And she wouldn't accept help. And I mean, she, all her clothes had been ripped off of her. I mean, it was really, 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 really scary. And um, I think we need to start thinking of uh, better ways to deal with uh, the drug addicted homeless um, situation that we have going on here. So I'll stop. Okay. Well, council member, I think we're overdue for um, uh, one of our uh, town hall meetings and I think we can readily do that. So one. yeah. Well, Thank you, Mayor Farrell. Sure. You bet. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we can do that. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, September. Mm -hmm. I think that's a yeah. good idea. Council Member Sepadasan. Thank you, Mayor. I have no report, but I think that's in line with the email I sent you last week. So thank you for the town hall meeting that we're, I think, yeah, we're due for it. So thank you now for You're saying welcome. yes. You're, You're welcome. The, su the suggestion, and I might start, the suggestion about the purpose of it was to figure out whose responsibility it is to do certain things. That's not an issue, uh, but I think it, it. I think we need to have um, well, hmm. a, a town hall meeting mm -hmm. Um because uh, I think it's a little, we're all long overdue. Uh, Deputy Mayor Hunt. Thank you. Um, today I listened to a discussion for, it's a national local officials webinar, and these webinars have been going on uh, since the pandemic. And people from around the, the country call in and, and listen and have an opportunity to ask questions. And today it was on gun violence, public health, and the Safer Communities Act. And the presenters uh, were Dr. Vin Gupta, and he's a physician at the University of Washington. In the, um, he also is a physician in the military and is an expert in gun violence. And uh, Jonas Orenski of Every Town for Gun Safety. It was really interesting. I can f forward um, this discussion it was for an hour to any any of you who want it once they come out with come out with the. Um, uh, once they come out with it, but it, it was really, really interesting. And what Dr. Gupta said is that gun violence now is a leading cause of death in children in the United States of America for the first time ever. It used to be uh, car accidents, and that's just devastating. 
Um, also on Saturday, the Boys and Girls Club is having a back to school event. It's at the 8th Avenue Boys and Girls Club. It's from 10 to two. There'll be free school supplies. Uh, there'll be food. There'll be all sorts of things for the um, for the kids and the parents. I encourage you to come early. Last year we ran out of supplies really like around noon. So it's a free event for for those who need it, and we look forward to seeing you all. Council President Coach Martin. One minute to go. No report. All right, Mayor. Can, can I make one quick comment? Yeah, go. Hey, uh, we have collected uh, more than six thousand dollars in gift certificates, cash to help the victims of the fire on uh, uh, the Terra Great Apartments, job. and we are still collecting collecting them. We uh, so everybody there has received some and is doing a tremendous amount of good. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, with that, we are adjourned. <laughs> Time for that. At 10 p.m. 9.58. All right.